Hello again, everybody, and happy spring. The WWE gives us a rock concert, and AEW gives us the same old song and dance. It's the first Jim Cornette experience of the spring season. I love to sing uh, about the moon and a June and a spring. Uh. And joining me to do a duet, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you, the showstopper, the chart topper, Playing mounds of sounds and stacks of wax, all designed with you in mind. The great Brian Last, everybody. Uh, Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again. I will say, I don't mind playing my music, but a duet, that's a step too far because I don't know about your singing on top of my music. No, come on. You know, is it true? Is it true that you will be at the Holiday Inn in Woodbury, New Jersey with a deep purple cover band next Friday night, two shows, no. seven and ten? I would never play with a deep purple cover band. We'll be someplace in Paramus. I'll be the Howard Johnson, so you can come see us there. All right. You know that, that pipe organ they got at the Evansville Coliseum? I heard now they're not going to restore it. They've digged a Sean Delaney, our man in Evansville tweeted that uh, there's a big news story now that th this gigantic pipe organ that they have in the old Evansville Coliseum, that the pipe organ is almost as old as Coliseum, so 100 years, give or take, whatever the fuck. And it's like five times as grand as a big church organ. It was an old-time thing like they used to play back in those days. And they've let it go into such disrepair that now it's supposed to cost like $4.8 million to fix this fucking thing. And, they, and they're trying to save the Coliseum as a building. because Strangler Lewis wrestled there. And, and so did some of our modern favorites through all the Memphis years. But uh, So now they're not going to save the organ. I wonder if they could do like sell pieces of it off to to Evansville citizens and pay for the rest of the renovation that way. That's right. Save the organ, the Lorena Bobbitt story. Now you gotta, you see, you're, it's springtime and your thoughts have turned to nasty. You gotta, <laughs> That's how you you gotta go there. You gotta immediately take that. I'm talking about the restoration or salvation or, you know, the salvation, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands on the radio. Of this historic old piece of history. That's most historic pieces of history are historic, aren't they? How big is it? How tall is it? Well, <laughs> how big a boy is he? And how much does that guy weigh, Art Donovan? Uh, no, I don't. It's a. It, it, it's not the the height of the. Th I think you're thinking of like the Phantom of the Opera, you know, playing this gigantic keyboard all around. Yeah, it's the, I need one of those. There are some gigantic pipes, but then also there are little ones. There's a, a more pipes to this thing than than you find in your average organ. And I can't remember all the statistics, but the keyboard is somewhat manageable and it's the the pipes and their breadth and length and whatever that makes all these tones so you didn't know that of see i've told you all about organs here today on well, the program i'd like to acquire one i guess that's my point many people have Get in said touch in with the me, past Evansville. that many people have said in the past that you need to acquire an organ who but, uh, you know, give your me detractors. Names. Give me names. Well, I, I'd rather give you the names of people who like you. It would take oh. me less time. Is there a list? But yeah, it's springtime, Brian. I'm just joshing you because spring is here. Had a wonderful day yesterday. I didn't look at the internet from from dawn, I believe, when I got up to dusk when I laid my weary head down. I... Didn't do any business per se. I it was the first day of spring cleanup here at the castle. The Monroes were the first day of the Monroes of the season. And doing the yard, the, the, I had them go around because we're almost ready to mow here. It's been so unseasonably warm in between bouts of monsoons that, uh, not gorillas, but uh, rainstorms, that uh, I'm getting ready to mow early. So I had to have the Monroes come over and do the cleanup where they pick up all the sticks and the limbs and the branches and the dead things that fall from the trees over the course of the wintertime. And I will have you know that for the first time ever, they fit everything in one load in the pickup truck. 
We have conquered Mother Nature here. I feel in control of the situation. Usually there's chaos. And last year we had those ridiculous storms. And now, no, we tramped it all down, put it in the fucking pickup truck. Aren't you proud of me? Proud? Now, proud's not the word I would use, but it's a... Sounds like you have a feeling of self-accomplishment. That's really what it's all about. Yes, that's that's what it's about. The accomplishment. If they we we opened up the windows, cleaned the house, beat the rugs. Uh, we 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 had things going on inside and outside. All the spring cleaning. Then dust was flying. The the tree pollen and the mulch mo- mold on the outside and the dust on the inside. How's Harley reacting to all this activity? Oh, she just takes a nap and ignores. It. Except when she she loves the Monroes. She they she loves the Monroes. They uh, she gets frisky every time they come around. So once but once that she got used to seeing them again, then she settles right down and just you can if she's taking a nap out in the backyard, you can run a weed whacker ten feet from her and she don't give a shit as long as you don't bother her. She's a very chill dog. All right. Anyway, so it's uh, did you uh, what are you doing up there for spring? Oh, I forgot you're in New Jersey. You ain't got spring the yet, The garden have you? state. The garden state. Yeah, yeah. How's your garden growing up there in the middle of March? Well, the weather's been nice. It's about to drop down. It was 72 the other day. I think it's going to be 45 today. But it'll be warm again permanently soon. And things <laughs> will be blooming. Well, things will be blooming starting in April and, and May, the big green explosion. And then I'll be in the <laughs> pool. So there's... Things to look forward to. Baseball season's coming up. Hey, uh, that's uh, you're, you're just you're grasping at straws now. Besides I like food, way. and uh, I have a wonderful <laughs> desk here. I'm sitting at, and I'm having a great time. <laughs> you were able to. That's all you aspire to in life is a little bit warmer weather and baseball season starts, and then you're grasping, and it's like, and then the frogs come back from Capistrano. <laughs> All right, well, we got to do a couple of things here first before we get on there. We got a special interview today. More on that later that everybody's going to get a, a tickle out of. But we've got to clean some things up from... You wanted wrestling history? You're going to get wrestling history. Yeah, you're going to get... Be careful what you wish for, folks. Uh, but we, from previous episodes here, we made some errors, which we'd like to correct. We are always in the, you know, in the mode of correcting errors when they come to us and... Brian, this is potentially this is actually your fault. I'll you'll see what? that easily as soon as I well, it's it's of course it's gonna be your responsibility here when you hear this. All right, let's hear this. I'll hear it easily, you said. Let's hear this. Yeah, you'll hear it first thing. Hello, Jim and Brian. I got a laugh out of your most recent episode on the drive thru when mentioning Sergeant Slaughter, now living in Burlington, North Carolina. Jim then mentioned the Burlington Coat Factory came from there, in which Brian questioned if Burlington Coat Factory was based out of Burlington, Vermont. Vermont, yeah. Being a Vermonter, (laughs) I too thought that was where Burlington, I thought it was a Vermontaniac. (laughs) I never never heard the term Vermonter before, actually. a, A Vermonter. There's gotta be some fucking limerick that ends with mounter over it, but anyway. I, too, thought that was where Burlington Coat Factory came out of Vermont. Okay, that's tortured grammar. (laughs) Because of how much our winters, unless there's some sexual connotation, because of how much our our winters suck. It makes sense. Yeah, Burlington, Vermont, cold place. You know, in in his mind, he's thinking, okay. It's up north. It's near Canada. It's cold. It's Vermont. In doing a Google search, I found out that they originally started in Burlington, New Jersey, which surprised me. So this is your fault that we made an error, Brian. You're the one who said North Carolina. How is this my fault? Because you live in New Jersey. I'm not from New Jersey. You're from right next door. I would have known if it was Indiana. Or even West Virginia, and you now live in... How long have you lived in New Jersey, even if you weren't born there? I've lived there like a decade now. Okay, well, do you expect Zsa Zsa Gabor to know her way around fucking Hungary at 75 years of age? See, so this this was your fault that we made an error because it's right on top of you there. They're, they're literally making coats for people walking down your street. 
and you did not know this, and you... I've never been to a Burlington Coat Factory. I don't know where they are. I don't know if it's a factory or just a store that calls itself a factory. I don't know anything about this place. But it's in Burlington, and that's in New Jersey. So where? I have no idea where in New Jersey. I don't have in any Burlington, knowledge New of Burlington. Jersey. I don't have any knowledge of this. I don't have any... In Burlington? They've just said this. I in can't Burlington, comment. New Jer- How big is the state of New Jersey? I can understand we're talking about Texas. Oh, it's, it's big. Or Alaska. It's big. It's a big state. Oh, fuck you. It's, it's that's long. What, it's long. That's what... Sh- that and it's got some think- girth. That's what you keep trying to tell people, but they, she don't... I mean, they don't... Believe it because it no New Jersey takes you what an hour and a half drive oh, from one end of New Jersey to the other. That's not true. And again, from the beaches of the Jersey Shore to the hostage standoff in Trenton, we have so much going on here in the state of New Jersey. <laughs> you come check it out. To the uh, to the oceans white with foam, <laughs> the and mountains sharks. in the valleys. Yes, it's the uh, Garden State. Come check no, out the Garden. You, You opened us up here to uh, giving out incorrect information because you do not even know the geography and the, and the industry. And how many industries is there in New Jersey that you wouldn't immediately know? What? No, what? Uh, Okay. Let me ask you this. Fucking couple of mom and pop fucking drug stores at a goddamn all night gas station. What else they got up there? Do you know Poland spring water? It's yes. It's from, from Warsaw. No. Where do you think it's from? Poland spring. I figured it was from Poland. That's probably the last place in the world they've got clean water. First of all, it's from Maine. Second of all, did you think they were importing all the water over from Poland? Well, if it it, (laughs) if they're they're gonna sell this goddamn brand name water, there ought to be some work in it. What is somebody in fucking Patterson, New Jersey, just turning a fucking spigot on and filling up the bottles? Not Patterson, New Jersey, Maine. Patterson, New Jersey. Okay, then then Augusta, Maine, or Francesca, Maine, or Poland Springs, Maine. Poland Springs, Maine. Well, now that's confusingly. That's like Moosehead, Maine. It's it's. It's confusingly fucking nay. You 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 think, but there's no moose heads in Maine. We found that out, and we've also found out that Burlington, New Jersey, is the third most famous Burlington we can think of on the East Coast. Well, you may have something there, but they've still got a coat factory. So if 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 we expect to stay warm, I guess we ought to keep on their good side. Anyway, we apologize for the. Do you apologize for making the error? To who? To the to the to the listeners, we have some journalistic responsibility here, don't we? So say 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 somebody out there needed a coat real bad. I'd like to apologize to the listeners and my wife for these comments I've made on the show about Burlington Coat Factory. All right, apparently from New Jersey somewhere, not from any of the other nice places we mentioned. You don't you don't realize what could have happened here, though. Because it, next, what next you're going to say, there isn't a guy named Jared picking out all the jewels. I would. Now, wait a minute. Are you talking about Jared from Subway? And is that some kind of veiled reference to <laughs> something he's doing in prison? Or if I. <laughs> that was referencing another common commercial, the Jared jewelry, whatever the fuck it is, exchange people. Oh, company, I don't know. We, I, I don't know. We jingle. get him down here. Oh. And we get uh, the, oh, the other goddamn you have the I, jewelry exchange. It's been so Hackensack. long since I've been in the market for a diamond. I've forgotten the other jeweler guy down here. They got this one commercial up here for the jewelry exchange, Hackensack, but I think it's kind of like a syndicated thing where like the people in the Hackensack store get their moment at the end where for like three seconds the camera rises up and you just see everyone there awkwardly waving. Because that's what you want from your jewelers. <laughs> These people that look like they're being held at gunpoint, yeah. waving at you as the camera flies away. <laughs> hold, hold both hands up and and then turn your back and count to 50 if anybody moves. But anyway, no, but nevertheless, you're distracting from the fact that we made an error and we apologize because yes, we, we want to correct this because we didn't want anybody. If somebody was cold out there and shivering and needed a coat bad, and we had sent them to North Carolina or Vermont. Well, then not only couldn't they afford a coat, but they'd be out the fucking money to go to Burlington, North Carolina or Burlington, Vermont, and they still wouldn't have a fucking coat. That's right. So we do apologize. I apologize sincerely from the bottom of my heart. Yeah. Tom, tell it too. Nah. All right. So if you, if you, if folks, if you want a coat, go to New Jersey. All right. Secondly, do us all a favor. Stay out of New Jersey. We're good. Well, 
I don't know if you're good, but I would have second the emotion of staying out of New Jersey. I don't know if you can get that cold. Uh, also, we were talking recently, Brian, about your friend and mine, poor old Don LaPrey, who made all that money back in the 90s, placed those tiny little classified ads in the newspaper and from his one-bedroom apartment. And, and Brian, as you and I discovered, ended up meeting with a, a tragic and an untimely and a hilarious uh, end. And we have a... <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have one of those. Yes, we, we certainly have, do. I belched there. <laughs> <laughs> we have an email. We have an email here about Don LaPrey from a former employee Whoa. of Don LaPrey. Get out of here, really? Uh, for a short period of time. And by the way, people on after they listen to the clip and folks on YouTube, if you go Jim Cornette on Don LaPrey, even if you don't know, because we didn't know some things about a guy that we were talking about until we looked it up on the air. And some people on the Internet were going, yes, his, his tiny little obituary was carried in newspapers across the country. I went from a one bedroom apartment to chopping my dick off in Lifetime Fitness. <laughs> and you can too. Here's how. So this is from John. Last name redacted. Hello, Jim and Brian, you cackling fool. I listen. <laughs> I sound like Wayland Flowers and Madam over there. Are we going to be able to do this fucking program today? I don't. This is like the curse of LaPrey. He's like found a way to ruin the segment but make it hysterical at the same time. Uh, All so, right. uh, we are good and we are professional. We're ready to go. Yeah. Hello, Jim and Brian. I listen to your Yahoo clip. Yahoo clip. Oh, I guess they y Yahoo it on the, I think YouTube. Maybe he's doing the autocorrect thing about Don <laughs> LaPrey today. And wanted to answer some of your questions. I worked for him at his Tropical Beaches office gimmick what? in Phoenix in early 1998. And that apparently is one of his sub companies. And by his the way, based on that video, when, when uh, the video, the audio we played under the show, I think that would have been around the same period of time, late 90s. Well, apparently this, this company might not have gone, as we will see, might not have been for everybody. Um, his scam at the time was selling the tiny classified ads in the newspaper, but what he didn't tell you was that the ads were for 900 numbers that you invested in, and that's how you made your money. Placing the ads were for your personally owned 900 numbers. So he's got, he's got another deal going on here. Getting people to call it after seeing your ad was the trick. It was all bullshit, although one guy claimed he made quote unquote, really good money by getting two 900 numbers and placed ads for him in over 300 newspapers. That man's name was Gene Okerlund. <laughs> and we can't tell you now, but if you call the, and that's uh, uh, right about the time that the 900 numbers were almost starting to implode with the spread of the internet where you could just call anybody anywhere with anything for any reason and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then you just had to pay for them to show you their genitals. Um, so anyway, he continues. I don't know who answered the phone when people called, but placing the ad wasn't where Don scammed you. Getting you to buy his money-making secrets kit to learn how to place the ads was how he got the bulk of his money at the time. If I remember right, it was about $300 for the kit. I was a telemarketer that worked in a large one-room office instead of a small one-bedroom apartment where probably 80 people were calling numbers all day from a sheet you were handed in the morning that were full of phone numbers that were generated from people calling for more information about this secret offer after watching the infomercial. And we were instructed to try and sell the kit for $300, but if that was too much for the customer, We'd negotiate it down until they said yes. Some sold as low as 75 bucks. The main thing was the sale, any sale, and that seemed more important than this kit's actual value, and we worked on commission. So 
He says, I saw Don at the office one time. When I left that day, I saw his personal parking space, and he had a white convertible, maybe a Porsche, parked there. I quit after about two or three days. I didn't have the guiltless conscience that those other sellers had to scam people. I reported him to the Better Business Bureau, but never heard anything else about it. I moved to North Carolina a month later and hadn't heard his name in decades, and after listening to your show, I was stunned to learn he had committed suicide. But I was sitting next to one of his top telemarketers while I worked there, and this guy was the epitome of greasy douchebag with his designer clothes and headset phone standing up from his chair and dancing around whenever he would complete a sale of this shit. Love the show, John. So this, apparently, this is the last venture then, if, uh, if indeed then, well, when, no, when was it that Don? It's like 2006 or so, right? Okay, well, no, he was still, maybe he was still farting through silk at this point. Well, remember, the, the, thing they, around. the thing they busted him for, from what we read, was selling fake websites, wasn't it? Ah, wait, yeah, there you go, because the websites took the place of the 900 numbers. What if you had been able to use those skills for good? You know, just to take them and actually start a legitimate business and do it the right way. Well, but the thing is, is that everybody that has legitimate skills that uses them for good has already taken up all the fucking good ideas. You can only, you know, use legitimate skills now for fucking ill-gotten gains because every crook can think of something new. I would be fascinated to know what the budget was to buy infomercial time. Because it was everywhere. So how much money was he making and how much was he spending on just advertising? Well, and again, that was one of the things that killed professional wrestling on syndicated television, whether local territories or even the big companies, you know, really phasing out syndicated shows because at that point in time, everybody was willing to buy an hour of TV time on a local station in some market somewhere off peak hours, off network program feeds. And they didn't, and the local station didn't have to fuck with having a sales team on it or spending any time on it. And they didn't give a fuck if anybody watched it or not, because they were making all their money with their local news and the network, you know, uh, time that they got in prime time. But that's everything was an infomercial. You remember the fucking the solo flex, right? Infomercial yeah. gimmick with Paul E, our our friend. The duel between I've told you that story, right? Obviously. I don't know what story you're talking about. The the commercials, the the dueling uh commercial revenue between ECW and Smoky Mountain Wrestling in nineteen ninety four or whatever it was when we found out what Paul Lee's trick was. No, actually, I don't think you told me this story. Oh, God damn it. All right, then I apologize for the, the longtime listeners. But in those days, in television, the if you were syndicating your show for the wrestling programs, let's say that, everybody's been seeing the local promos, right, that, that we've been talking about or that people tweet out, we're, we're coming to Raleigh. In the in the wrestling show in in Raleigh on the local station, the the or whoever your promotion was, if they had an hour TV show, their deal with the TV station was the station gets some time, and we get some time to promote our live events. Well, later on, as you syndicated your show across the country with the '90s and blah blah blah, and uh, you weren't running all those fucking towns, and you're trying to get. It didn't have to be a wrestling program. Any fucking program you're trying to get, you know, on more stations. The easiest way to fill up your commercial time and make some revenue was what they called PI spots per inquiry. 1-800-BUY-THIS-SHIT, right? The pocket, if you call 1-800-WHATEVER and buy the Popeil Pocket Fisherman, or the Richard Simmons deal meal, or whatever the fuck it was, the number that you called was dedicated to that spot that was in that show. So that means that that show got credit for selling that pocket fisherman. Have I explained this properly, Brian? Yes, you have. Ron Popeil, another name I forgot about before. 
There you go. And uh, instrumental in the Vegematic. But uh, so, it, like, it, when Smoky Mountain Wrestling, Bill Barons was helping us try to get not only stations we wanted in our area, but he also had the ability to get us on, like, Channel America and America One, which were networks, per se, uh, that basically fed programming to low power and really small independent stations across the United States. It had, you know, weak signals, but they were they were operating television entities, right? Because then you could put these PI spots on, and if somebody called to get the record offer or called to get the product in, and bought it, you got a little payoff, right? It was per inquiry. And so we were running those spots. But one of the big ones in those days was the Solaflex spot. Remember when everybody wanted to work out in their own home and get in shape, of right? Course. Yeah. And Solaflex was such a big ticket item. It, it, you know, one of these things cost a couple grand back this 30 years ago, whatever it was. That for that spot, if somebody just called up and said, I'm interested in your product, can you send me the demonstrative video and brochure and all this information about it? If somebody just made the step to get the information, made the phone call, then whatever number they called, whatever spot they called from, you got $5. They didn't have to buy anything, right? They just had to call, and I want the information. Send it to me. So Bill Barron's got us hooked up with that. And, you know, these things at the time, we were making a couple grand a month from the PI spots. And, you know, this had been going on for a year or so. And it was, it was you know, later on in 95. And Barron's happened to be talking to whoever the agent was that, you know, was in charge of the Solaflex spot. He was renewing whatever the fuck, the, the new spot. And that's when the guy said, yeah, boy, we thought, you know, you do as good as that other wrestling show that we're on, but you haven't really. So what's that? He saw that ECW show. Said, well, how how good are they doing? Because Bill knew where they were. They're doing the same thing that we were doing, the, the independent low power stations. But they weren't on the air on broadcast at the time at all. And we were. So we had the same homes they did besides sports channel Philadelphia or whatever, but we had actual broadcast stations. So it should have at least been equal, right? Oh God, they did $6,000 last month. And what the fuck? And we did like 800 or whatever. Six thousand. And then when Bill calls me and tells me, I said, wait a minute. I said, I've been getting a Solaflex fucking ad brochure you know video whatever the fuck they're sending out this package i thought it just because we had the spot going and i told hildebrand the story and he said well i got one too and then we come to find out that coraluzo dennis was still around bless him at the time and he said i've been getting one addressed to dick coraluzo <laughs> <laughs> and we come to fake because Hildebrand was from Pennsylvania, and right? And Dennis in New Jersey. We come to find out that everybody in the periphery of that Philadelphia, New Jersey, Northeast, or anybody that would be in anybody's address book, because all you needed was an address to send this shit, right? And people actually had people's street addresses back in those days. Everybody had been getting Solaflex brochures. Paul E. had somebody calling over and over everybody in the goddamn in their address book requesting hi this is brian last from you know fucking 86 the fucking fuck you street and so i said god damn it he's a fucking evil genius i said two can play at this game brian the team is in need i'm talking to hildebrand right I said, get your address book out, boy. He said, what? I said, start calling and telling them who the fuck you are and where the fuck you live and make us some money. If they can do it, we can do it too, right? What's good for the tit is good for the tat. So Brian, he sits down with his address book and he calls up. And the first one, he says he's whoever the fuck he is. He lives wherever the fuck he lives. 
And oh, I'd love the information on this. Boom. He hangs up. And then he calls again. He does a second one. And he tells him who he is and where he lives. And he'd like that. Boom. And as he's working his way down, the, he's still in the A's, right? In the address book. He calls up again. And the third call, the woman said, didn't I just talk to you? <laughs> and, he's, and you know, Hildebrand, my God, he shit himself. He's humming, 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 humming. <laughs> See, that's the thing. You said Heyman had someone do it. It may have been Paul himself. Yeah, well, yeah that's. I mean, they they obviously had this thing worked out. I just gave Brian some homework, right? So he said he hung up and he called me up scared. <laughs> I said, I said, you haven't committed any fucking actionable fraud. Never mind. We can't do it. We can't be crooked. It's not within us. But that was the Soloflex deal. And I get he was financing a good part of ECW with fucking ordering Soloflex, probably never printed so many brochures and made so many videos in their life. All right, it's Tuesday. We make a demand from Vince and Linda, and then we get some money from them. And then Wednesday, we spend all day calling Soloflex. It's called Soloflex. <laughs> And then on Thursday, we order some weight gainer and uh, other stuff from the other commercials. <sighs> but anyway, uh, what was the subject of that? Oh, um, it was Don. Don LaPrey. Don. Well, R.I.P. Don. And uh, I guess we should... I'm going to be on TV again. I, I, I promise you I will look no differently than the last time you saw me. Reason being is that it was shot at the same time, but it's new to you, folks. Uh, the Dark Side of the Ring on Vice TV this coming Tuesday. What is the the number to go along with that that day? Um, it's that the nineteenth, March nineteenth. That's right. It, March nineteenth uh, on Vice TV will be Terry Gordy, the uh, the fabulous free bird Terry Gordy, and I will be one of the people involved in spend and I hope I've, I've seen a couple of the pictures they've got obviously from, you know, Terry's family and everything, just when he was so young with his hair bleached blonde already in the business. So I'm hoping that, uh, they have some cool stuff that we haven't seen before of, uh, of Terry at his younger career, but also I'll, I'll look the same age because I haven't aged in, at least in this footage. Did they already do a reenactment? Because I'm thinking about it. I was like, you wonder if they're going to do one. And then I'm thinking, I think they may have done it in one of the other episodes where Terry Gordy beat up the police car, started headbutting the car. Uh, Am I wrong? I don't. I, I remember some some abuse of, of vehicles, but I'm not sure exactly what happened. <laughs> Wasn't there a story he got like, arrested? He was drunk, but they, they couldn't really. He was gigantic. They couldn't do much. He just started headbutting the police car. <laughs> well, but Barbarian did that, too. Really? Well, you and what? Eh, when they were making a, a, a with Piper, a, oh body slam, body slam. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, that was a story. I love Barbarian. I'm not trying to embarrass him, uh, and he loves me too. I hope. But no, he when he had flown out there, he's in California, and he's appearing in. Even though he's working for Crockett at that time, right? So he's living in Charlotte, but he was one of the wrestlers had got a spot to appear and it's been so long since i've seen body slam i can't remember the premise but that was the movie they were shooting yeah, right? the, the premise is that m harry smilak goes <laughs> from being a scummy music manager to getting into the sleazy world of wrestling and he manages quick rick roberts roddy piper and his friend tonga tom who roddy piper just feuded with a year and a half earlier the tonga kid and they feud with the very cleverly named Captain Lou Murano. Oh my God. And his team of the Barbarian and Tijo Khan, or as they're called in the movie, the Cannibals, Axe and Hammer. Uh, okay, and Tijo was in Charlotte Forest. So, and. And who obviously... hosts the biggest wrestling talk show in the country? Do you remember that? Apparently, like TNT, I guess, for this movie? Uh, no. Charles Nelson Riley. Oh my God. No. Okay. All right. I got to. Now I got to see this thing again. Because it's been 40 years, and I don't know I paid attention at that point. And then the big but, fight scene at the end, the big cameos out of nowhere for Bruno and Flair and Freddie Blassie, and then a brawl breaks out with all the California indie guys in the second row pretending they were just watching the matches. 
Did you just watch this last week? I love this movie. It's the best wrestling movie. There's some stuff that you cringe at in 2024, but there's so much. And in terms of the cameos, it's a great movie. It's the best wrestling movie. Well, all right, very good. Thank you for everybody that's going to send me a copy of this now on VHS or DVD or whatever. I can watch anything except the newfangled stuff that you got to stick inside of the computer. Anyway, so Barb is out there is where, where he is. He's out in California. And since he was away from home for a number of days and he was away from his wife, Saini, and he was at the, the story goes and give or take of a, a, a slight exaggeration or two, this is approximately how it happened, is that he was at the bar in the hotel and he, because he didn't drink at home, because saying he didn't like him to drink. But it, as he was in the bar and he's all the way in California and he's probably catching up with, you know, other people he hadn't seen in a while because this wasn't like a all Vince production as you've just illustrated. It was kind of a free-for-all with people, you know, from all over the place. And when they want to close the bar, he don't want them to close the bar. And when they want him to leave, he doesn't want to want to leave. And he just, he doesn't not he doesn't want to get the shit for free, but he wants to continue paying for his drinks as long as he wants to be there to drink them and pay for them. And so they called some authorities who arrived to, who were equally unsuccessful in convincing him to the point where that a scuffle broke out, which saw that they figured out that you can't handcuff the barbarian because his arms won't even go that far behind his back. And you can't mace him because he will fucking lick it off. Of, he'll slap his fucking face with the palm of his hand and lick it to show dominance. <laughs> and if several officers do indeed get two sets of handcuffs joined behind the barbarian's back, he will either cave the top of or break a window out of a police car if you get him in the back seat, finally, with his head. And then when they took him to jail or wherever they take you to sew you up before they take you to jail, they sewed him up, and then when they put him in the cell, he started headbutting the wall and opened it up again. So the next day, he was himself again, and more willing to listen to reason, but also by that point, as we all heard when all of this uh, got back to Charlotte, Saney had flown out there, and basically the story that we all heard was that it sounded like she more or less walked in there and grabbed him by the ear and fucking led him out with her thumb and fucking finger cussing at him the whole fucking way. He had this one great line of dialogue where he confronted M. Harry Smilak, and he says, hey, Your name Smilak? Because he could barely speak English, it seemed like. That sounds like it. Well, it, it, you know, it could be a little dramatic license. He he didn't, uh, he wasn't usually that gruff. He's a very, very calm fellow, except when adding alcohol. Well, this film was the career highlight of T. Joe Khan, that's for sure. Whatever happened to T. Joe Khan? Well, he left the NWA to join the House of Guleen, where Mark Gulleen famously introduced him and he ran out of a lake on a freezing day <laughs> and ran away. And then, you know, I think he did a little bit in the AWA maybe in their dying days in Vegas. And then he was just gone. And I think Went he back to Minnesota. I think he died a few years ago, but he had that oh, look. No. He was one of the early road warrior clones. He, he was more of a, he wasn't a, he was an El Mongol clone with a good body. He had the face paint. He had the haircut. Oh, well, now, remember Tijo when he started, he didn't have the face paint because he was more Mongolian, hence Tijo Khan. Then, and then he just, they started gimmicking him all up because they couldn't figure out exactly how to apply everything. Tijo Khan. We have different cons now in wrestling. All right, well, should we check in with Tony Khan's bunch real quick? Uh, there's just a couple of news items that we've got to go over with the AEW crowd, and then we'll start catching up on on some of the wwe business and related ephemera but <laughs> brian have you heard the boyhood dreams dashed at the foot of reality poor darby allen ain't gonna get to climb the mountain have you heard about this 
I did hear about this, of course, on AEW Dynamite, which we reviewed on the drive-thru. We talked about the big injury angle where they broke the foot or the ankle of Darby Allen. <laughs> Little did we know, we thought this was a weird way to write him off the show after he already said, I'm leaving to go to Mount Everest. Little did we know he actually did break his foot before they, in character, broke his foot. This whole thing he is did, ridiculous. They didn't, need, they didn't need the angle. He'd already done it for him. And folks, I'm not laughing at someone's misfit. Yes, in this case, I am. In this case, I'm laughing at someone's misfortune because when you, when you stand outside with handfuls of corn cobs and go suey, 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 and the hogs trample you, what the fuck? You've brought it on yourself, right? Right, Brian? Have you ever done that? Never mind. The point is, he fucking injured himself before he could get to the injury angle. It's, I mean, this, you can't write this shit. And it happens over, so let's recap the situation for folks that may have not been paying attention. Darby Allen, by his own admission, was homeless and sleeping in his car five years ago when he got the, or right before he got the AEW job. He is uh, on the very small side to be a professional wrestler, so the odds were against him to begin with, but he's got the natural charisma of something that helps him along, and so he's defied odds and logic there. He comes uh, across a company funded by a billionaire that will take a chance not only on anybody but give them a lot of money and he gets a guaranteed contract and now five years after being homeless he's on a national television show and Brian we don't have any idea or we're not even speculating what Darby Allen is making per year Just give it a placeholder figure is it I think $250,000 a year from what we hear about. Oh, it has to be more than that. Well, that's what I'm saying. Much from what more we, than that. From what we hear about Tony Khan's, uh, you know, MO and, and payroll would be a, a drop in a bucket. You say it has to be much more than that. Should we say 500? It may be more. It may be less. Let's say five because it's a round number. If you want to say five, uh, just sign us NDA over here, please. Well, the point is, let's assign some numerical fee. Let's say 250 because you scoffed at it. So that's the lowest it could be. But you've gone from homeless sleeping in your car to a job on national television making a quarter of a million dollars a year where you only wrestle. You appear basically once a week. You Let's say he wrestles once a week. And because some weeks he don't wrestle and some weeks maybe he does fucking rampage or whatever the fuck. And some people are going to say, well, but he throws himself off the roof in every match. Okay. Much of this is his own choosing and not necessary. So every time that this guy shows up and gets in the ring, he makes five grand. And then of course, that's a ridiculously low amount. So is it 10 grand or is it 15 grand or whatever? He's got the merchandise going on. He's got this job where he's making a lot of money and he's also in a position where almost no other wrestlers from any other generation before have been in, in that if he gets hurt, the promoter will pay him his guaranteed money until he's better. If the show doesn't draw, the promoter pays him the same thing anyway. No matter where he is on the card, he's going to get his check in full. All of those things. So then he says, you know what, this is good, but I think I'm going to go climb Mount Everest. Now, not that he has ever clumbed, clumb or clumbed. No, he hasn't. Clumbed he's never, a mountain. I have never seen him clumb before. No, he's never clumbed. <laughs> A mountain before has has no ex experience whatsoever in, in clumbering up that mountain, baby. He's a mountain clumber. He's a, he's a, well, he, we'll never know, but he just says, I want to do something I've never done. I'm going to climb a mountain. Not only I'm going to climb Mount Everest. And now for a, for a, 
an artiste such as the, the the brooding twink, I think MJF called him, or whatever the fuck for his... I called him that first on this show. Well, okay. Well, okay, so then MJF stole that from you like he stole, you know, some of the things from me. But nevertheless, what a crook. Hope, hopefully he'll steal the original of his contract from Tony's office and get the <laughs> fuck out of it. Nevertheless, in his, in his artistic mind, that might be a thought that would run across you. And then it should be up to your employer who has given you this incredible spot of a lifetime to say, well, Darby, that's all well and good and we appreciate it, but maybe you should channel your ener energies into a little more productive pursuits and, oh, remember that five grand or 10 grand or 15 grand or whatever the fuck it is a week that I'm paying you to come and be on my TV and wrestle? If you go and fall off that fucking mountain and die or paralyze yourself, not only are you dying or paralyzing yourself but also all of my money that i've paid you all this time has gone to waste because you've taken yourself out of the ball game so maybe it might not be a good idea for you to, for you to do something like that but oh no that's when tony says fuck that'd be cool that'd be cool i bet they hang around the fucking arcade and and wait for Fonzie to come in and fucking elbow the jukebox on to play oh, their favorite know. song. Tony may party a bit too much for Darby. And so he says, okay, well then let's publicize it. Okay, I can understand if they had planned, you know, that they're going to take a camera with this motherfucker and they're going to have these live feeds from Tibet. I don't know where the fuck Mount Everest even is. And some way they're going to get some programming out of it somehow. But goddamn, they tell everybody he's going to leave on March 27th to go climb Mount Everest. They've been telling him that without the specific date for quite some time. And then in Sting's retirement match, where he wants it to be all about Sting, he tries to kill himself, to the, does a thing to the point where they had a plan B if he couldn't get up and come back. And that steals all the attention. So everybody's, oh, what's next for Darby? He's going to go climb Mount Everest. And he comes and does a fucking TV match against Jay White that it, it, not only was it eh, but also, as we mentioned, they closed the match by doing an injury angle to explain his absence when they've been telling people, including on that show, yeah, he's leaving to climb Mount Everest. So that looks so fucking phony as a goddamn get well card from an undertaker anyway. But then in a, in a double reverse rib, while we thought that the mountain climbing might get in the way of wrestling, the wrestling has gotten in the way of the mountain climbing. Before they got to the injury angle, dipshit had broken three bones in his foot doing some type of something off the top rope uh, to begin with in the match and now can't climb mount everest because he's a one-footed mountain climber your thoughts brian well do we know how long he's going to be out was that reported I, I, I think you have to climb you can't just fucking i'm not talking about climbing now just a foot no, well, but here's what I'm saying is that he's out of climbing Mount Everest because if you don't leave, like, I guess when the Sherpas leave and the fucking burrows are ready, I don't know what the fuck, then you can't go for another year. So he says it's going to be 2025. It'll be next year and he'll go. And I'm sure Tony feels awful about how awful Darby feels about this. So he'll make sure he gets <laughs> the best Sherpa he can get. <laughs> you know, I'm pretty sure about that. You can guarantee that. Um, <sighs> you know... No one knew he was going to get hurt. And unlike you, I don't hate Darby Allen. I like Darby Allen. He, I didn't hate him. He's I didn't the hate one until he dove through the fucking plate glass window. Oh, that was the stupidest thing ever. And again, his excuse was he didn't want to take anything away from Sting's match. He dove through yeah. a plate of glass. But no one knew he was going to get hurt. So if you're going with the idea that he did not have a broken foot going into this match, why did they do an injury angle right after he already said he gave... It was one of his best promos because it wasn't just I'm going to Mount Everest. It was I may die. I may never come back. 
<laughs> I love you all. Thank you for every. It was a goodbye <laughs> speech. But then they broke his foot. And they did an angle when they broke his foot. And then what were they going to do when they, if they did try to publicize him actually climbing the goddamn mountain? Would they say, well, here while he's recuperating from his broken foot, here he is climbing Mount Everest? What if he unfortunately died? You'd have crazy fans blaming Jay Ping Pong White. <laughs> You're the reason he got that blood clot, you motherfucker. So they did this injury angle. Now that this news is out there, what do you do? Do you say that they broke his ankle or do you acknowledge, as it's been reported, because it got out right away, that he actually broke his own ankle on the dive? What do you do? Well, no, now wait a minute. Let's let's try to be more precise. They foot, they were they were targeting the ankle in the angle, and 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 gravity in reality was targeting the foot, and he broke apparently three bones in his foot. And I, there was one thing that he did. He did the coffin drop off the top rope, and the guy was on the apron, he moves off the apron, and Darby bounces off the apron and spun off onto the floor, and I, when, when I saw that, I thought, well, he had to have blown his bursal sack in his knee. It looked like he landed on the point of his knee at one point. I thought he had crippled himself there because it was a right to the point of the knee on the floor, and that wasn't it. Apparently, maybe, maybe I was the same thing as, same movie broke his, his the foot on and he was too hurt but with the foot to notice he fucked up his knee. I don't know what this guy is doing. He flusters me. But that's the it's a point of now with the AEW schedule. Jesus you, Christ. You should be happy if you get like three or four matches out of your favorite guys in a calendar year. It's just insane that they have got there has been no logic to this from the start, and now the whole thing ends up in a popcorn fart because he they couldn't even say, my God, after Darby flung himself off the equivalent of a fucking two-and-a-half-story building through that thick pane of glass onto a concrete floor, he's he's all stove up, as Aunt Lola used to say. And... He's going to take a couple months off. Instead, they come back and do a fake injury angle, but they've still said he's going to go climb the fucking mountain. So no matter how banged up he is, apparently he was going to climb the mountain, and if they did an angle to explain his absence while he's climbing the mountain, that means they weren't going to publicize the climbing of the mountain, but said mountain will not be climbed, nor clumbed, nor clambered up. Because he fucked himself up on it before his goddamn angle to fuck himself up. I, I think I need a tranquilizer. Well, we now have one year, Darby, to get ready for Mount Everest. Tony can get ready with a camera crew. And we'll see. You know, I guess the message should be, Darby, if you want to do this in the month leading up to it, don't throw yourself through a plane <laughs> of glass. Or a pane of glass, I guess. Plane of glass. A plate of glass or a pane of glass, I combine the two, and cut your entire back up, and then break your foot in the weeks and leading you, up to this. You know, what about, here's another thing, he had all those cuts on his back, he's fixed to go fucking ride those burrows up Mount Everest. What if the, the burrows had some kind of fucking flatulence disease or something, and those cuts got infected? Well, he could come back as the goddamn, as a werewolf. You know, there's just like dead bodies that are frozen all over the place up there, along with a lot of garbage that people leave behind. Like, or you, as as the Sherpas call it, uh, snacks. They don't eat the dead bodies. What are you talking about? Well, they're frozen. So they wouldn't be spoiled. That's cannibalism, Jim. Well, I'm sorry, Bones, but <laughs> but what are you gonna do? God damn it, Jim! I'm a co-host, not a whatever, a Sherpa. If you're up there and the going gets rough and, and you're, you're there, the picnic basket is empty and you're, well, there's, there's Harry Styles from fucking Cleveland. He's frozen, but he has Harry pictures Styles. of his family in his wallet, but he ain't going back anytime soon. So it, I wonder, would he miss a, a forearm or a calf? All right. And, and don't forget also, thought. they injured Darby, and then there was a whole other angle where they turned on Billy Gunn right after that. Oh, that I wasn't even the end of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least now they're moving in a different direction. 
Uh, and we hope that Darby limps, limps on back to action real soon now. Y'all, you hear? Go to Gum Alley, see what uh, kind of special medicine you can find. He won't do that. He's straight edge. But uh, get well soon, Darby. I am a fan of Darby Allen, so I say get well soon legitimately. Well, and you know somebody who I don't know if he if he was injured by this or maybe his feelings. I have a feeling his cheeks were burning from embarrassment. But uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm already regretting it because I know, like, I feel bad right now that he got hurt. And like next week with his broken foot, we're gonna see some video of him driving a car off a mountain somewhere. <laughs> oh yeah, he's not gonna with with his foot sticking out the window. <laughs> yeah, he'll be with fine. With his foot sticking out yeah. the window, so it'll be fine. It's in a cast. It's over here. I'm I'm you know. But no, the other fellow with the hurt feelings uh, is is our our best friend, the plumber, John Moxley, because apparently now there is footage of the plumber. Remember, he was in a some kind of and he even admitted it amateur jujitsu tournament up in the greater Cincinnati area. This was months back, and and the news came out. Well, he won, he won his division in this amateur jiu-jitsu tournament that took place near his home. Death jiu-jitsu. There you go. He's got the death jitsu, you know, no, don't give a fuck. And apparently, come to find out, that's what nobody gave about this tournament was a fuck because when we got clarification on the details of this big victory, there was one other guy in the division and Moxley won that match, so he won one fight or one match or whatever the, the term is that they're using professionally by beating this other amateur guy. And that's how he won the division. So, but still people say, well, Hey, he's out there doing it. Right. And these are the same people. Now it was the CM Punk who fought in the UFC twice, who went through the training camps, who went and learned it as Lance Russell would say, we went and learned it. And went through the training camps and actually fought and added buys to the program in the ultimate fighting championship. But Moxley's out there doing what he can do on the local level. And apparently now there's footage out there of him going to the mat and in what was it? Brian, you saw it. I don't I can't believe it took a minute of scuffling. Was that the whole thing? He was choked out by the Figure four leg scissors of somebody that looked like he, you know, is a paint clerk at Home Depot. I'm sure he's plenty tough. Well, you know, because those paint cans are heavy. I understand that. Well, and tough all, guys. All, the chem- all the chemicals all day, the the methylanzolines and the methamphetamines that you inhale with the paint, he could, you know, that's that, that's dangerous shit. Well, I think if you work at a place like that, you have plenty of time to train, maybe. You probably have a good schedule and a pension and a union. I mean, it all sounds like it's working out yeah, for this guy. A lot, a lot of paint to huff. Yeah. So, how the was this the whole fight? Was that it? The, no, the no, clip, no. Or was he, that that was the last uh, like 35, 40 seconds of what I heard was a two hour and ninety minute grapple. No, come uh, on. People are comparing it to Gotch and Hackenschmidt. Two hours and ninety minutes. It couldn't have been a a, a a a second over two hours and seventy-five minutes. I'm gonna give John Moxley a tip. Train in private. That's I guess the issue. There's nothing to be ashamed of that he's trying to that he's learning this and he wants to learn this, that he wants to be better at this. But if you're an AEW TV being presented as Captain Badass, ah. the flag bearer of the Blackpool combat scene. And then you're getting choked out with the legs of some guy, like it's legs Langevin or something. I, 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 I mean, on on TV, he's taking bigger people and top stars and stronger people and younger people, and he's choking them out, and he's eating their best shots and popping right up, and he's he's making them beg for mercy and plead. Fed Kai's Ernie lad would say, and call for their mama. That's what he's doing on TV, and in front of people, witnesses with cameras that have access to the internet, he's getting choked out by fucking part-time amateurs in fucking walk-on tournaments on a local yeah. level. What the fuck? Yeah, Punk was on the uh, UFC pay-per-view events, and he had a UFC jersey even made. Moxley was in the Cincinnati Armory <laughs> against whoever. 
And there's footage of it. I mean, that's the other thing. See, that's like I said, there's nothing wrong with him doing it. But if you're the promoter, if you're Tony Khan, do you want this kind of footage out there? This isn't a private training session or you, you know, rolling around with your friends. This is a tournament where tickets are sold, it appears. People are there. Anyone could be filming this. Oh, yeah. It, it, there was, it looked like a local spot show crowd of a couple hundred people in the high school gym stands or whatever. There are people there. This is not goddamn secret society fights. So injuries aside, which is a whole other concern, you know, just like the Darby Allen discussion, that one of your guys is going to get hurt competing in a grappling tournament or a BJJ tournament or whatever it may be, for just the image, for just the way it looks, for the optics, for all the reasons Bill Watts didn't want one of his guys losing a fight in public, this isn't public, this is on video. If you're a promoter, do you have a problem with this? I, I, in a variety of ways, um, in a variety of levels, in the in the previous generations where nobody would have had a video camera or any way to distribute it, if, if it was your you know middle card guys, you guys would enter bodybuilding contest. Remember, and uh, well, you don't remember, you weren't born, but Rip Rogers and Randy Savage decided to enter a regional bodybuilding competition in, here in Eastern Kentucky when they were both with ICW and trained really hard and got really cut up and did the thing. And I think Rip came in third and Savage came in fifth. And it wasn't, it wasn't viewed as they showed footage on television because it wasn't viewed as a, a loss, like we didn't win the thing, but that here, our professional wrestlers placed this highly in another physical or athletic endeavor or sport or whatever, right? You can, you can do those type of things where it's a little branch, a little offshoot. But um, in a space, if it's a major tournament, right? If it's some kind of major deal that... Remember when the, some of the wrestlers got on the... Was it CBS or ABC World's Strongest Man competition? Patera was on there one year. Crusher Blackwell was on there one year. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's uh, they're not saying that they're the strongest man in the world, but they're placing with people who, from a variety of sources, are. That's why they're having this competition, and they're doing well. They're on the short list. They're on the short list, right? But now that uh, you can't do anything in public on a local level, if you are a star and you are doing something that's so incredibly close, not only to wrestling, but to the wrestling that you actually do, that it completely deflates and takes the piss out of your whole fucking gimmick, right? You can't, you can't tell me that if who's your favorite action movie star, action hero, physical fighting fucking guy, Brian, my favorite. Yes. Douglas Fairbanks. Oh, God damn it. I'm tough from the sound era from the sound era. Clark Gable. All right, fuck. I'll I'll do my own similes. Thank you very much. Whether you were I like era, uh, Rudy Rudy Ray Moore. I like Rudy Ray Moore. Okay, but I don't even know who the fuck that is. Don't so, mind. Oh, okay. All right. Dolomite is his name, and fucking up motherfuckers is his game. What I'm talking about is whether it's Bruce Lee or it was Chuck Norris in the days of martial arts were over, or. Sylvester Stallone for the Rocky movies or Apollo Creed or Schwarzenegger or whatever. For them to just have the teetotal shit kicked out of them by some waiter at Applebee's or some accountant that's in a fucking elementary basic Taekwondo 101 class and have footage of it broadcast around the world when they are on screen playing these invincible heroes or whatever the fuck would be somewhat embarrassing. Would you not agree? I would. So that's the, the point is not that he giving him the old rah, rah, cause people are still, as we said, they're fucking ribbing and pissing all over punk for fighting in the UFC twice. Cause he lost. Well, but guess what? He got there and did it, made a difference in the fucking gate and and fulfilled something at a high level. He didn't go and choke out some goddamn 
you know, fucking soccer dad in Newport. And it makes you so, think about that meeting with Punk and Moxley. Remember, we heard about the one where Moxley wanted to do Rocky Three. I kick your ass <laughs> in like two minutes, and then you come back later. Oh, you wanted to do that. Here's Punk sitting there. He's been through training camps. He's probably thinking this guy's acted like the biggest badass ever. Has he ever been in a real fight where someone could well, where someone couldn't use their legs to choke you out? Well, I was about to say he's. He's been in some real struggles. Some of his matches, it looked like it's a goddamn, uh, you get your dentistry degree, pulling teeth, trying to get something out of him. It's a real struggle there, but only in a working sense. But nevertheless, so uh, uh, apparently this is a, a, he got him, the, the guy got him with a figure four head scissors, right? He's, he's got his hands free and he just wrapped his legs around Moxley and Moxley, see, you, he can't get out from under him. He's got nowhere to go. And he's, I fucking tap done. It, it, I was about to fish hook his ass. What you said, this guy's making from Tony Khan, I'm sure in the millions of dollars, wouldn't everyone agree that he's got to be making seven figures a year? No one told oh, yeah. Khan. No, no, no. He's making several million a year. Yeah. Okay. Then in that case, hire your sparring partners and fucking do this in private where there are no cameras allowed and get to a level that people say, you know what? We could get you in a legitimate regional tournament and we believe that you have a reasonable chance of winning a match or two. And then go for it. But don't just show up a supposed celebrity playing the fucking death jitsu expert at this, at Tony Khan's expense of a couple million bucks a year and get punked out by fucking unemployed lifeguards or whoever this fucking guy is. Death jitsu. I tapped out. There you go. And it's, it's not that hard. He can afford... If you're if if you want to do something like that in public, you have a responsibility to your employer, to your image, to your gimmick, to your opponents that have to sell for this shit. Either be real fucking good at it and do it in a way that they can promote on the actual wrestling show that you're paid to do, and it's not em embarrassingly small time or unsuccessful, or yeah. don't do it out in public. Hey, O'Neill does Brazilian jiu-jitsu. You never hear, oh, Al Bundy got choked out at the Civic Center the other day. Well, and, and, and besides that, poor, you know, that would even be more acceptable than this because Al Bundy or even goddamn modern family fellow, can't call his name right now, doesn't it, it project to millions of people, well, not millions of people, but a number of 100,000 people every week on TV that he's Billy Badass and a combination of Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan with Johnny fucking, Badass. Well, there you go. Whichever badass. He's, he's it, 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 that's the thing. He's not that guy and he can't even get his public persona consistent when he presents shit to the public. I hope AEW doesn't trademark badass. When I go back, I'll have to be stank ass. You know, I'm surprised he's not joined up with the guy that ruled ass and ate ass. Oh, yeah. That, but that guy, you know, it's funny. There were some guys in the first year or so of AEW, some people they signed, some people that just showed up on TV, that if you criticize them, people would say, you don't know what you're talking about. This is what's big on the indies. That means it's the future of wrestling. <laughs> Give it a chance. This person's good. They're big on the indies. People there like them. That's just a small microcosm of society. A very dark, weird subculture of society, but nonetheless, they're big on the indies. Give them a chance. Have any of those people, I mean, we're five years later, you don't hear about any of them anymore. Are they still active? The war horses of the world? He was the, he, he was the one that ruled ass, He's right? He's the one that ruled ass. We've gotten more play out of you talking about that than we ever did about talking about him. But they had another one that sounded like he said one time that he ate ass. Oh, no, that guy's still there. That's one of the bear guys who became an Iron Savage who, last I saw, was asking another wrestler to go to Titty City, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> Is this an establishment that he, he works at as part owner of or just, uh, you know, a, a crowd gatherer for? Titty City.
But again, you know, the, again, going back to the Moxley thing, Moxley's supposed to be the biggest badass. That's the whole Blackpool Combat Club gimmick. The fact that him, Claudio, and Danielson are just three completely different types of badass who all worship Steve Regal. I don't know what exactly the gimmick is. But the video went around. Again, talking about what goes around on social media is different than what the average person going to a wrestling show is. But a lot of the times with AEW, you got to think a lot of those people know what's going around. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of those people might have what's going around. You just keep doing what you're doing? Has this changed the way you use John Moxley? Well, you're trying if to it's another, if, it, if it happens again, if another video pops up of him competing in some BJJ tournament and getting choked out quickly, what do you do? You're trying to put logic in an illogical man's mind with Tony Khan, I'm sure, is, is nothing wrong whatsoever because it's all bullshit to them anyway, and that's the, the way they approach it. But if I was a... If I was either a legitimate wrestling promoter or a legitimate Hollywood fucking studio or producer or production company or whatever, I would go to my star and say, again, unless you can do this at an acceptable level in an acceptably widely viewed or, you know, high level environment, do it in private. Do not have your ass handed to you on local cable access or in front of people's camera phones again because you're damaging the the persona and the character and the aura that we are trying to build around you as our action movie star slash uh, pro wrestler slash fucking supposed tough guy fellow that it is the same thing as did who would have wanted to seen. Well, I, a lot of people may have wanted to see it, but how would it have affected Mr. T's career on the A-team if in the biggest season, which I believe was probably the first or second one, if he'd have had the boxing match at WrestleMania and just got the shit kicked out of him with no fucking response whatsoever in a shoot? What would that have done for him? Hey, we heard Dr. Death was the baddest guy on the planet for a decade. And look what a loss after tearing his hamstring or whatever it was did to his One loss. One loss. One loss. Fuck, yes. Which was why Ali's people all of a sudden got limber tail about the finish they had agreed on, which is why a lot of situations have turned sideways uh, over years in boxing and wrestling and mixed martial arts and whatever the fuck. And this guy is just going out and saying, ah, yeah. I'm doing this for real here. What I do on the show is a show, so everybody knows the difference. Should so what voice is that? I don't I don't I can't sound like Moxley. You sound like Moxley. Hey. Should they bring in the guy that choked him out? <laughs> no. Because probably half the fucking roster they've already got could choke that guy out for real. <sighs> Well, we will see what happens, but again, there's nothing to be ashamed of pursuing athletic endeavors, and we congratulate John Moxley on his pursuit of grappling greatness. Well, yes, can we can we also congratulate uh, somebody else on uh, greatness in grabbing grub? The uh, have you heard the the rumors the the rumors and the whisperings and the actually the people saying this on Twitter. Have you heard what now they're saying that they've heard that Tony Khan is paying Mercedes Monet? Have you heard about Mercedes's Monet? I did see this and I think it's ridiculous because <laughs> yeah. Tony will pay a lot, but this is ridiculous. Folks out there who have a more discerning logical mind and listen to our program, the Twitter birds on on the Twitter verse are saying that Tony Khan is paying Mercedes Mooney $10 million a year in Monet to wrestle for his organization. And Brian, yes, that is completely ridiculous. And here again, we were just doing a clip last week where we said that Tokyo, the newspapers, Tokyo Sports reporting that Oh my God, Okada's got 13 million over three years. That was, has since been shot down by sources close to the situation that is still in the millions, but it ain't that ridiculous. 
and they think that they would that he would pay Mercedes Monet three times as much as that or whatever and do it all at the same time. What about poor old Will? Poor Will Ostrich, now just a plane ticket to fucking Heathrow and back every week. Ain't looking so bad now. But no, it's it's preposterous, but it speaks to, I think, a problem that Tony is starting to get that not only do the fans just accept at this point, they just see these signings and this money being bandied around and these you know, this endless pocketbook from AEW. And they believe, they believed Okada 13 million. Now that some people are believing Mercedes $10 million a year, it, it paints a, a horrible picture for Tony that people will actually take even preposterous numbers like this seriously, doesn't it? Blowing my inheritance, moaning, moaning. <laughs> Damn. Da, da, da. Ratings down, rehost down, come on, moaning. <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> I need more time for I'm gonna end up like Don LaPray did. Oh, come Don on. Stop yeah. that. Stop that. I don't yeah. even understand where that yeah, came from. Yeah, tiny little cuts. <laughs> and you make the cuts. <laughs> moany, moany. Um, no, he's. <laughs> If people, even some people, even a few people can believe figures this crazy, doesn't it show somebody that they're getting a reputation? And will some of the wrestlers start believing it? Will they start coming in with for negotiations with the expo? Well, I heard you were giving so-and-so $10 million. There's another way to look at it. Tony <laughs> Khan being irresponsible with money is a legitimate thing. It's a very, very, very legitimate thing. Wrestlers being underpaid based on how much revenue they generate compared to other sporting endeavors is also true. Yes. Top wrestlers, wrestlers that actually cause things that produce income are probably worth millions more than they get paid now. The ones who don't matter much are probably worth considerably less and should be paid less than what they make now. But... $10 million a year is ridiculous for Mercedes Monet. I don't think in a fair world that money's ridiculous, that amount's ridiculous for a main eventer. Oh, no, no. Well, in, I mean, in that company, yes, yes. But for a man, for, for a, a... Well, no, but again, I go back with the philosophy of Tony has the money to burn. It's not ridiculous if you get a main eventer for that money because it sends the message, we have the money to spend for more of you guys. Well, but no, I look at it like... <laughs> Is anybody going to make him that much money? And the answer is no. If you took Roman Reigns or Cody or I dare say, I dare say, Colonel, I if you took The Rock and and put them on the AEW television program, working for AEW as a company. Nothing else changes but their addition to the roster and whatever they are can do or allowed to do or whatever the fuck, their performance. I don't think that any of those people could make the money back for Tony and the company that they would have to pay to get them because nobody else has. They're not making any money. They're losing money. So... I think that the, the guys in the WWE, by and large, the top guys, no matter what they're making these days, probably ought to have been making more and should have been making more for the last fucking 25 years, and especially since they went public. And like you said, I think there are some guys in the WWE or wherever the fuck that probably have been very lucky to just get one of these middle level, really high paid for, you know, for government work type of job and just don't make any waves because they ain't really going to go too much further. The ones that do sometimes quit and go further. But I don't see anybody that you could add to AEW Okada. I'm not saying that he's the shits, uh, our friend Willie. 
it's not even whether they're the shits or not, or whether they're a big star or not. If you take stars that aren't the shits and that are over and put them in the AEW environment, they will not be able to produce uh, what uh, income that they that offsets the expenditure to get them. Hey, listen, week two with Okada. I'm a fan of Okada. I've seen a lot of Okada in the past. Really talented guy. If you want him to be a main eventer who makes a difference, who means something to people who haven't already seen him, you don't bring him in and put him right with the Bucks and then put them in six-man matches. The ratings for this week's show, it nosedived in that segment. It's because they put him with the Bucks. So now you got someone making main event money, but the booking kills him before he even gets going. Because how's he going to be seen as a main eventer now? Because the booking never supports anyone, so usually it's as good as it gets at the beginning. Well, again, look at Will. Will has gone, has been taken to the limit by the flunky in his own heel group, Cal Felcher, and the the other guy who's not really been focused on as a world-class level world title competitor, our boy Take. So... He's got a three-year contract. There's a great example. There's a great example of someone with talent, someone who's getting better, who they give a little bit and they take a whole lot back. Takeshita. There were a few weeks ago they were doing promos where him and Hobbs looked threatening next to Callis. Then he lost to his stablemate. Then we haven't seen him since. How does that help anyone? The point being, you can only justify paying millions of dollars to someone now what's the merchandise we don't have numbers on their merchandise have they got a new merchandise person over there at AEW yet since they they fired mrs buck a well again they have someone new in charge and they do a lot of stuff with pro wrestling tees certainly they do a lot to benefit that company okay so but, then, but merchandise then, has been something where they've been lacking for a long time where even if you have someone who's highly merchandisable, highly uh, marketable. You need the right team behind them. Vince McMahon, even when things were bad, he always had that. Well, and and that's, uh, if, if you're giving somebody millions of dollars a year, but after you add them into your program, the ratings stay the same, the ticket sales in the average market stays the average that it was, better or worse, whatever, beforehand. The Are you moving tons of merchandise to justify this incredible amount of money? What other... What, what, I, help me. Help me. When you're spending millions of dollars for a top star, don't they need to be a top star? You would think, again, unless it's someone who doesn't have to worry about the bottom line who can throw around money like it's play money, but it's real money. And again, it's a drop in the bucket. It's a drop in the bucket. So if it was one of the WWE main eventers who were a free agent right now, Tony would have probably gone in there and doubled what WWE offered them. Now, you won't get WrestleMania. You won't get any professionalism in the back or anything. (laughs) But you'll get a ton of money, and if you want to stay home whenever you want, you can. The schedule, the lifestyle is a very easy lifestyle. As long as you don't get too beat up internally about confusion, lack of direction, the booking, the formatting, anything else. If you're someone who's like down with like classic, what made WCW work? Hey, I want to get a check. I'll show up. I won't show up. I'll stay home. Whatever. If you have that kind of attitude, it's the best place ever to work. Did I, did I answer your question? What was your question? Yes, sir? yes, I'm, 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 <laughs> yes uh, is the caller there? <laughs> and remember, it's the safest company in the world, too. And you know, and I know this is not about Mercedes or her Monet, uh, but they also, they've put out statements that, well, you know, before we allowed Darby Allen to perform that dangerous maneuver through the glass off the ladder with professionals looked at it and his carefully plotted plan to do this safely. And it was determined who, <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah. He went through glass I to wanna, the floor. I want to see, see the, the fucking backstage footage of who did they call in? That is a professional in a motherfucker flinging himself off a ladder through a real piece of glass onto concrete in one take in front of fucking 
goddamn thousands of people, it, even in Hollywood. Nobody does that. It's not done. And who approved the his plan? What was his plan? What was your plan here? Can you just just sit, just take a seat, just sit down for a minute. What was your plan here, Darby? Well, that was the uh, ten million dollars uh, rumored to be given to Mercedes Monet. Yes, it was money and well you know, spent. Well, and right there, it's money well spent because now Mercedes Mercedes is going to be in the Monet. And and she's just fine. But now, again, Tony Khan. Tony Khan, I'm afraid he's going to have to slash expenses, Brian. I'm afraid he's going to have to start cutting back on other things, other aspects of the company, in order to be able to finance this kind of talent. And I think he needs to start with his phone bill. Have I told you, you know, we might as well offer Tony the deal that we're offering all the customers out there and the members of the cult of Cornette. We ought to give him the same courtesy. We can get him a phone plan through our friends at Mint Mobile for only 15 bucks a month. And that's an unlimited, because you know that Tony talks in an unlimited fashion. I think that's one way that his press conferences can be described is unlimited. And not only that, but he texts a lot. We know that because his fingers can't stay still. They got to hop around a lot. He's a shimmering and a shaking all the time and hopping around and jumping around. And that's because he's so excited of all the money he's saving because the Mint Mobile plan, $15 a month, also includes unlimited data. And you know how Tony Khan's mind, it loves to process the data, Brian. He takes that data and it goes in one ear and it comes out the other ear. And then he just does what his basement uh, fan group liked to book in the high school years. In one ear, out the other, go back to high school, do it again. Folks, they didn't have a plan like this in high school. Brian, how much was your phone when you were in high school? My phone bill was pretty high because I was calling people around the country. It was pretty uh, crazy. Well... Around and the world, can, actually, now that I think about it. Yeah, you can. When I was in high school, my phone bill was almost twenty dollars a month, but that was fifty years ago. So you can see we've come full circle, and now you can get a phone plan at fifty years ago prices, fifteen dollars a month if you go right now, folks, to mintmobile.com/jce. Wireless plans starting at $15 a month. You can choose from three months, six months, or 12 months plans. And they come with the unlimited talk and the text and the high-speed data on that nation's largest five-gigger network. Every time that somebody signs up for Mint Mobile, somebody in the Mint Mobile network is forced to do a blade job. They're going to gig themselves. No, they won't. And they certainly, and, and that's why they certainly won't. the butcher. At the end, Abby had all those scars because he was doing part-time work for Mint Mobile. I bet you didn't know that. I did not know that. You didn't know that either because it's not true. Well, but I just said it, and some of these things might happen eventually. Mint Mobile gives you the best rate whether you're buying for one or a family. And at Mint Mobile, families start at two lines. And it's, it's some kind of loose affiliation. I don't even know if they ask for birth certificates. If the woman blamed you, maybe you can get a family plan for the kid. And you can also use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contract contracts or contacts. Or all of those. You can keep everything. You know what? It's it's actually, it's a lot more convenient. Just use the phone you've already got, the number you've already got. Just switch over to Mint Mobile and pay less. Why wouldn't everybody do this? Very convenient and a great price. Well, it's, it's 15 bucks a month. There you go. And just uh, make sure you pay up on time, folks, because these people are not people to be messed with. They're from New Jersey. No, That's, we don't know that at all. And Just pay up on time like a good well, citizen. Well, That's wait the a minute, reason I, you need. I thought they were based in Mint Mobile, New Jersey. No, you're like the of Burlington Coat Factory. You're thinking of Mint Mobile, Vermont. Or maybe it's Mint Mobile, North Carolina. Well, right now, folks, the number to call is mintmobile.com slash JCE. 
and you can cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions may apply, but only if you're a convicted felon, and you're going to have to reveal that information along with a variety of other tax no. returns and financial documents that you'll be asked for at the time of sign I think it depends on where you live, and that's about it. Well, you can't tell whether somebody's a convicted felon by where they live. That's not what I said, but Mint Mobile, it's wonderful. Check it out. They support us. You should support them. One more time, what's that promo code, Jim? Well, if everybody's sporting everybody else, who's actually holding this son of a bitch up? Mintmobile.com slash JCE. <sighs> All right. You want to now can we talk about the biography? The biography episode from this past week. Scott Hall. A.K.A. Razor Ramon. The man who oozed coolness, according to The Miz. Machismo. He oozed machismo. Well, no, he said he oozed coolness. That's what The Miz said about... Well, what Razor Ramon would say was that he oozed machismo. Well, he at various points in his life, apparently we've come to find out he was oozing all sorts of things. Uh, <clears throat> you know, here's another guy that I... I didn't know that much about his personal life. I mean, obviously, we've shared uh, numerous locker rooms. I've worked of, in in matches involving him, et cetera. But it's not like we sat down and had long conversations. I was not part of the clique. So I didn't know about his personal life, uh, you know, his younger days. I knew about the altercation that he had had you know, when he was bouncing at the strip club that, you know, with the gun, that the guy got shot in uh, vague or, you know, uh, bullet point terms. Is that the kind of thing you had to report to whatever office you were working for? That you had that on your record, that that had happened? Um, well, <clears throat> I'm thinking, I'm th thinking, thinking. It, like, in, in the 80s, no. I mean, it's not like you ever, any promoter ever did a background check. They figured if, if this guy is fucked up bad enough that we've heard about it from wrestlers, you know, then we need to watch out. But otherwise, they never did a background check. So I'm sure when he was working in Florida, work for Crockett, Vern, you know, whatever, when it got to the early 90s WWF, I don't remember... You know, at least when I was in the office, uh, anybody really having a major extensive background check, but like Bam Bam Bigelow, you would have to know that guys couldn't go to Canada or whatever, right? Now, in modern times, I guess they, they run everything, but he wouldn't have had to just go ahead and say, well, Jim Crockett, yeah, Dusty's bringing me in, but I got to tell you about this thing that happened to me four years ago or whatever. Does that answer your question? That answers my question, yes. Um, and that's why I laugh when I hear some fans apply maybe modern standards or maybe stuff that's not even modern standards yet uh, to 40 years ago. Like, yeah, I was going to do a background check on a fucking job guy, right? But anyway, uh, what I was going to say was the more I see of a lot of these shows, and that's why the John Tenta Dark Side of the Ring to me was so refreshing. Because, yes, a lot of these shows are centered around people that were very talented. And then in some cases, I may have been a fan of or, you know, that I've liked on a personal basis or in my interactions with them or whatever. But it's heavy on, yeah, this guy was so talented and he made all this money and he had the world at his feet to give him anything. But goddamn, he fucked up an epic number of times and went to rehab 14 million times and, you know, damaged himself before his time and met a bitter end. It, it's, it's getting, maybe it's, I'm starting to judge everybody because I think of fatigue and weariness over, God damn, could you at any point have taken anybody's advice and help and just straightened the fuck out with all these people? Because like, they always say, Oh, I loved so and so. He was great, you know. There, there, and his friends are broken up about it, whoever it may be. Right? Not speaking specifically here. 
And then listen to somebody, Jesus Christ, at some point, because most normal people, they may have the friends that are trying to help them out, but they don't have world-class rehab at their disposal. They didn't get the part about the national TV stars and making, you know, shit tons of money and all the pussy and whatever. They maybe just had the shit part where they lost their job and ended up in a goddamn trailer falling over the fucking recliner. So I'm thinking that maybe sometimes these programs overall are making a lot of the boys in the business make all the boys in the business look fucking goofy. Do you see what I'm saying here? Do you see where I'm... Do you smell what I'm cooking, Brian? Unfortunately, yes. No, I smell what you're... I see the direction you're going in. Let me phrase it like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, th there was no lewd allusion to any kind of graphic bodily function, and do you smell what I'm cooking? You didn't need to goddamn take it anywhere else. But anyway, so that that's starting to color some of my opinions of this of the programming but they even had they they did have uh, some stuff they shot with Hall in 2014 that has not been used and they had his brother which I was not aware he had one but uh, he was another guy that you know as a kid he saw wrestling he was an army kid and moved around but um you know, it, it, he was able to go to wrestling with his dad and who was an alcoholic and they weren't particularly close and the parents broke up and he ends up in Florida. And that was at that point, the late 70s, early 80s, where, you know, everybody in goddamn Orlando either knew about or went to the, you know, weekly matches at the Eddie Graham Sports Stadium, which I worked at once was just a giant tin building out in the middle of a field that could seat like 6,000 fucking people. And it just, you can imagine what people screaming sounds like reverberating off a tin roof. And you know, he was going to get noticed because look at the size of him and he started the bodybuilding thing and everything. And so it, it I will say what well, the incident where he's working as a bouncer at a strip club, because that's where, you know, guys that size could make money in Florida and still, you know, enjoy Florida and do other shit. But if that had happened, geez, it, it wouldn't have happened if it had been just a bit later because it happened right before he was getting in the business. So if it had been a little bit later, he wouldn't have been there. Or if it had been a little bit earlier, who knows whether that may have, you know, played a part in, in something maybe he didn't fucking, uh, you know, get into business at all. So it was just, it was right there. I don't know the chronology. The incident happened in January, 1983. And, you know, he gets out of there, goes, goes to Tampa to train with the guys. But, you know, that was very quick before he got into business. And did you hear he stayed? It was over a girl. He broke his rule and started seeing one of the strippers in the club, and that's some guy that was involved with her came and pulled the gun on him and ended up shot. But he stayed with that girl for eight years. Would you not have made a, an immediate fucking left turn out of that whole situation there, uh, young Brian Last? I mean, it depends. Uh, maybe she was a great person, and of course he just took out the competition. Now you got nothing to worry about. Well, maybe she was a great something. I don't know. Please, she was would... great at math. And, uh, well, it just don't figure. So when you hear about one of these guys that you've had, you know, good and bad things to say about over the years and good and bad experiences with, and you probably never had a single conversation with him. I mean, you could tell me I'm wrong. No, I have had, about, you know. No, no, but so. about, but specifically about being kids going to wrestling or into wrestling. Oh, no, no. You never think about Scott Hall, the young wrestling fan, wanting to do it. Well, you know, you can actually tell because even when they're when they're very close to each other, you never hear Nash saying, "Oh, when I was a kid, I always wanted to be a wrestler." Nash had the the brain for the psychology, but Hall was the best worker of the Click bunch at that point in time because he knew what the shit was supposed to look like and had kind of liked it from a fan standpoint. So he, he got what, 
you know, fans would like and not like and how to do the shit. He, when he found something that he could put himself into, which took a while with all those bad gimmicks. But, you know, that's the thing with, with Hall and Nash and Michaels and then, you know, Triple H became a part and then, you know, uh, it, each one of them individually, talented guys, witty guys, funny guys, whatever, had their their moments. But I think, as I've said before, when they were all together, it brought out the worst in all of them because then they were all trying to outdo each other as far as who could be the the biggest fucking pain in the ass to work with in some cases. Uh, but he, but that's that Hall tried hard. He wanted to get in the business. He said he, he when he moved to Tampa, he joined like five gyms just to you know find out where the guys were working out so he could get in with them. And you know pretty soon by what early 1985, so he's broke in, trained, had a few matches, and you know he credited Jack Lanza for who was obviously a you know a a say in the AWA at that point for bringing him to work for Vern. So that all happened in what, a year and a half. And they didn't really say it here or if they did, I missed it. But the story always was that when Vern first saw him, he thought this is my Hulk Hogan because he had yeah. just lost Hogan and he was this giant Tom Selleck looking guy. Yeah. And that's why he gave him the inventive nickname of big Scott Hall. Uh, it, it, that's, I remember concurrently with that, that uh, a lot of people, the, the early and underground few number of sheet readers and writers and the smart fan populace was, Oh, this guy's supposed to be the next big deal early on. And, and he looked great. And then as they started seeing him they're like, Oh, and then it became big Scott Hall became a, a rib, right? For this uh, most boring nickname for the most boring wrestler that we've we've ever seen and and that was i think that's why they glossed over the first five years of his career here at about two minutes of tv time because you know whether it was uh what dusty's thing with him and spivey was the american starship they were going to be what eagle and coyote wasn't that it coyote yeah which one was coyote and which one was I think Hall must have been Hall coyote. was Coyote. Yeah, Hall yeah. was Coyote. Uh, but he, Dusty had seen him in Florida, obviously, and felt like he had something. And then, and I forgot, that's right, He came, they came real briefly to work for Crockett when Dusty was there before they that Hall went to the AWA. That's right. And then Spivey um, somehow got hired by WWE to become Golden Boy Danny Spivey, and then he became the replacement for Wyndham. There you go. As the blonde-haired member of the U.S. Express. Yeah, because we, we when we came to uh, work for Crockett, we had missed, they were just introducing Spivey as Starship Eagle. And I'm like, what was what happened to Jefferson? Where's the other Starship? Go? What is this? <laughs> and Coyote was already gone to, to Vern at that point. And, you know, the the bad gimmicks that they gave him, Hall, I mean, in WCW, when when he first got there, which, uh, you know, he called Dallas Page, he said, for help getting in. And they, they come up with the George Michael look, the toothpick, the earring, the diamond stud. Well, remember, he was there before that. He was there in the summer of 89. He was one of the many, many, many people that popped up. He was on the Bash pay-per-view. Oh, fuck, you're right. He was a crocodile hunter or something. Maybe not a hunter, but he was from but the that's Everglades. That's right, he was dressed up like he was Marlon Perkins. But he was in the uh, the two-ring battle royal at the Bash. Yeah, well, there, there that was a, a memorable run, as you can tell. Well, the point is, finally, they start putting the look together. Because he he had just been, like you said, Tom Selleck, just the big generic white guy with the mustache. And they they put the look together, but that was the era of really rotten gimmicks in WCW. And they showed <laughs> Nash as Oz uh, and he glossed that whole WCW run over briefly. And then Bruce takes credit for seeing him on TV and calls Vince and Hall gets a chance to talk to Vince and says, well, did you ever see Scarface? And there you go. So 30 minutes into this two hour show, he's already in the WWF in 1992. So that was a, 
you know, pretty quick gloss over of the early years. But, you know, from there on, when you think about it, he's he's Razor or he's himself and everybody thinks of Razor. Himself was an offshoot of Razor for the rest of his career. And I, I couldn't even believe his, Even they, his speaking voice. I mean, you could tell that yeah. it kind of got sapped into his speaking voice where there's a little <laughs> tinge of an accent that he shouldn't have. Well, yo, you know, man, it's, it's like the thing. I don't know what you that know, is. It, it was never, well, I, I, yo, I, you know, man. What is that? I don't, I don't know. I can't, I don't know how to do that. Mink the Ville over here. All right. See, I'm, I'm, I'm from the, you know, Southeastern United States here where I don't, I just have an, uh, just a flat accent. I don't really have any accent where you can tell anywhere I come from. You see? But anyway, I enjoyed seeing the footage of Vince McMahon directing Hall how to do the Razor vignettes. Oh, you get into the character. Okay. Vince always wanted to be goddamn Cecil B. DeMille, didn't he? You know, where yeah. I've, hey, we all directed every booker or, you know, whatever directed people doing promos, but we didn't make it say, well, what would your character say? It, I'll say this, out of whatever the fuck, right? It, it, Vince wanted the Hollywood trappings about the thing. But anyway, Razor Ramon got over, and it seemed like it was a natural gimmick for him, and he he came out of it and was ever, or was, was you know, always able to get into it and make it more palatable. Even some of the, as they mentioned at one point, the accent at first was kind of a, it was an attempt at it, but the people liked the whole package point where they were willing to overlook it. But from these programs, I wish I would never hear the word character mentioned again. I did jot that down. Um, and, and they, you know, they glossed over the, or not glossed over, but went over the high points, the match with the lightning kid, Sean Waltman that made him the one, two, three kid and got him over. And, you know, the ladder match with Sean at WrestleMania 10. And, you know, it, his work in the ring, he really, for a guy that size, especially, he could move and he carried that whole deal off. <clears throat> but then again, now, but now he starts saying now that he's, you know, basically a star, he starts getting fucked up after the shows. And you had the quote from Michaels that they justified it by saying, well, we only do this when we're on the road, not when we're home. Well, they were on the road 300 days a year. And that's what his wife says. He couldn't turn it off. And he, you know, he couldn't uh, come home and be himself. And he, she wasn't happy being, you know, in that position, blah, blah, blah. And uh, yeah, you think I mean, more people need hobbies to look forward to, no matter what the trade is. If you're someone who's on the road, it shouldn't just be you look forward to coming home just to be home. Do you think they need things to look forward to doing? I, yeah, I will. I mean, yes, you always need to have things to look forward, but I always had things to look forward to doing when I came home that didn't involve, you know, getting fucked up the, during my period of time when I was home. I do, or, and or you know, or coming home to, I always stayed up with wrestling, but I didn't come home to be Jim Cornette in my house. I just came home to watch me and all the other people to see if I was still better than they were. Um, but that's, you know, that was why he went to WCW as, as, and we've covered the Hall and Nash's departure in early 1996 when they told Vince one thing to his face and then they faxed him notices and blah, blah, blah. But he went to WCW for guaranteed money and less dates. And obviously for a, a ridiculous amount for the time of guaranteed money that, you know, has been talked about before in the NWO documentaries and et cetera. And do the whole outsiders thing. And now, did you did you now hear Hulk say that? Well, now Scott Hall is the one that inspired him to turn heel. Because here he transformed himself. So if he can do it, is that a new story? 
I would have to go back through the files and see what he has said and what he hasn't said before. Do we have that on a spreadsheet? Hogan's lies to, so we can cross check that with, is it a new one or an existing? Has it been out there in the wild? I don't know. Well, apparently now Hulk says when, when the hall become in, and, and, and he didn't even really switch heel. He just changed himself <laughs> from razor Ramon to Scott Hall. And that inspired him to turn heel. It inspired him to turn heel. So he could get in the fucking top heel group that Nash yeah. and Hall had just formed. Bingo, there's the inspiration. These yeah. guys are over, they're cool. I want to be with them. I only want to be with them. So there was lots of praise here of the NWO from all the members of the NWO. And, uh, you know, but then again, he's, a, he's home more and he's a good father, but he's not happy with his wife, so he drinks too much. And he was there, and I guess, uh, you got to help me, I don't know whether he was, well, they said he was there for about a year and a half, and then Bischoff said he either needed to fire him or send him to rehab. And then Nash said that he had to quit traveling with him when he got on cocaine. And Waltman said that Hall would go to rehab and then, Waltman would pick him up and drive him home and, and he'd make him stop at a liquor store on the trip home. So was he, cause I didn't follow WCW specifically for Scott Hall's comings and goings at that point. He had to be missing a lot between what early eight 98 and the time that they closed down. Was he missing stretches of, shows work matches whatever the fuck was he just on and off like that and he was for a while as he was getting as they point out here messed up and then they kind of made him getting messed up part of the storyline so i guess where i'm going with that is bischoff and everybody says oh scott was so cool we all like scott bischoff sees this guy that he's paying more than he and Hull had, or he and Nash had the favored nations clause, right? We talked about it the other day. Bischoff had to go to them to get permission when he made the deal to Bret Hart or else was he'd have had to give them a raise. They were supposed to be the highest paid guys. And Bischoff is still allowing this guy to not only make his substance abuse issues an issue with his with the company sending him to rehab him coming out and flummoxing that and him still kowtowing to him about a deal like that and then it it, it at the end of it making an issue of it on the air putting it, it as part of the angle what the fuck kind of how do you do that on anybody's part how is anybody putting themselves in that situation I don't know. And they didn't tell us. And they didn't tell us. So, um, and then everybody to a person that was interviewed said that he was haunted by the shooting. He didn't mean to kill the guy. The guy was trying to kill him and they fought over the gun. So, yes, I can understand it being a disturbing incident, but they say he thought he was a bad person. He didn't deserve success. So he either wanted to act like somebody else or sabotage himself or whatever. But, but at some point, holy gee, Christ. So was he there at the end or had he already, they made some remark that he, he took his ball and quit. Uh, it, it, did they give him another rehab ultimatum and he leave before WCW closed or was he there at the end? Do we remember? He may have still been under contract at the end. I don't remember exactly. He may have just, just been home. Yeah. Because remember, um, Vince didn't bring them in right away. The NWO came into WWE, what, a year after WCW closed? Yeah, after after the bloom was off everything they could have got out of the big stars invading. Um, But, you know, Hall goes off the, the deep end with the arrests and et cetera, and that, all that stuff was reported in various places and they glossed that over kind of, but then when they, when they returned to the WWF, as you said, like a year later after that, they're at WrestleMania and he gets fired. 
and then the multiple mug shots and his wife divorces him and they were they had him on indie dates and you know making indie shots fucked up but they didn't even mention tna they glossed over that case which he no showed tna a number of times i think at one time while i was there they announced he was going to come in and do a pay-per-view and he no showed that's what led to Samoa Joe and Kevin Nash having an argument. But anyway, and then they, the, the footage that uh, a lot of people have seen in modern days of him in, in horrible shape at this indie show where they had to help him into the ring and he tried to throw a punch and fell over and he was just all fucked up and, you know, the the ESPN profiled him, and, and they said that, I think it was Stephanie, said WWE had spent more money on his rehab than anybody else they'd ever sent. And, but then, here comes Diamond Dallas Page. And, my God, the patience that he has for, for this stuff. Um, and uh, Hall went to Atlanta and lived with Paige and cleaned up and went in the Hall of Fame. I get that was for the, for the NWO, right? In 2014. No, he went he, in as Razor Ramon. Oh, he went in as Razor Ramon, and then they did the, the, the NWO several years later. Right. Is what, okay, thank you. But so he goes to the Hall of Fame in 2014. And everybody seems to be happy, and boy, that would be a great place to to end it. And then, apparently still in modern days, they said when COVID hit, well, that was 2020, he said they, he, he couldn't handle sitting home alone. I, I can't fathom the day that I would ever be unhappy sitting home alone. I'm not wired that way. That would that would be my Milton's version of paradise. Um, but anyway, so they said by the time they went in the Hall of Fame, so it was 2021. I wrote this down for the NWO. He was like passing out there and fucked up, and then you know the next year fell in his house and broke his hip and in the hospital had the heart attacks and and etc and you know again all of his friends just loved him to death hogan was the only one that seemed as if he was acting dramatically and dabbing a fake fucking crocodile tear everybody else was legitimate that they loved him and you just wonder why people that have you know opportunities beyond that of most mortal men can't ever, in a lot of cases, get their shit together. Very talented guy. I was lucky to see him. And, you know, he came in, he got a big push. Razor Ramon came in, he wasn't just some mid-card guy. They put him right into something with Randy Savage. They had him teaming up with Ric Flair. He was in the main event picture right away. And then, early the next year, he was one of the stars of the early days of Raw. And the big Sean Waltman match, he wasn't the Lightning Kid, he was just the kid. They ran through a series of well, names. But, but you know what? Did you did you see that he still had his lightning kid tights, so he had a lightning bolt with kid underneath it? L right? kid. <laughs> L kid. Yeah, L kid. But uh, no, that was a big moment, and that was a big feud, and Razor Ramon was one of the highlights of WWE while he was there. I mean, even to the very end, I know he hated the Goldberg, uh, not Goldberg, the uh, Goldust stuff. And that's one of the reasons Goldurst, Gold, I can't say his name. Goldurst? Goldurst. He was Fred he a, Durst's new band. Was he a cousin of Fred Durst? Goldurst? One, one of the reasons that Goldust worked was the Razor Ramon feud. Even yeah. Scott Hall hated it, but that's one of the reasons, that's one of the ways he got over right away was that feud. Well, and you know, that's another example of how to make stars. When you bring a guy in and he's presented prominently and featured importantly from the start and wins more than he loses and interacts in a competitive way with with top guys and pretty much dominates people that you know or, or are accustomed to or flunkies that's the way you used to make stars and even the wwe has lost sight of some of that 
to some extent with the stops and starts of, you know, whatever they've been doing over the years. But the other part of that equation, though, is you have to fa have the right guy. You have to have the right person that you're pushing in the right presentation. And as as Hall proved, this when he became Scott Hall and just dropped Razor Ramon and dressed a little differently, it was still that had become him, what he was, and to the point where when you talk to him, he kind of had a little hitch in his get-along in the accent, even if it, it, well, he was from... I was going to say, know, I was gonna say Vince tried to shut him down, remember? When he went to WCW, Vince tried to say that the intellectual property of WWE included the toothpick and the accent, and stuff was modified because of that. Yeah. They, well, he, he had to modify stuff because of the trademark, but so much of that was him or had become him that it kind of came off that way anyway. And that's an example. You know, the... Imagine if The Undertaker had switched companies and tried to be the gravedigger. It wouldn't have worked. But with Hall, it was it was it it was him enough that it was able to be just kind of branched off into a non-litigious direction. But then the the that's the problem is he would have been, so he was young when he got into business in the early 80s. He was in his early 20s. So, fuck, by the time that 2002 came around, his major league career was done. I mean, they, they tried to bring him back a time or two, and he went to TNA, and he did this and that, but, you know, he only got less than 10 years at the absolute top of the business and was still young when he self-destructed and would have been a commodity for another 10 years at least. He Hall in 2011 when he was being helped to the ring by people because he was so fucked up at an indie show in front of 200 people was was he 50 years old at that point or just barely? There's guys on TV right now making seven figures a year that are 50. Something to think about. He was born in 58. Okay, he was, he was 52 or 3, depending on when it was compared to his birthday. Which is, I believe, Christian's there, isn't he, Edge? It reminds me, of someone said years ago, I forget the exact statistic, but it was like, look at Hall and Nash and WCW. The Von Erichs, if things had gone a different way, would have been the same age, approximately, if they had lived during the Monday Night Wars. And that's kind of wow. crazy to think about, just in terms of, who was where at different points in the business. Von Erich started really young. You know, Hall didn't start until 84, 85, but they would have been the same age. It's kind of crazy. Well, and but nobody had heard of him or he didn't make an impact until the early 90s. So it, they were just barely two different generations, but it seems like so much more time passed in between than, than actually did. Well, that was biography. But would you like to hear about Rivals? Because Rivals, Rivals, biography for the same audience on Sunday nights. You know, this is one of those episodes I was really curious to hear what you have to say because it delves into something you were there for part of. Shawn Michaels' wild years as champion, <laughs> The Undertaker and Shawn Michaels in the mid-90s, but then it talks about a period where you had nothing to do with it. So I'm very curious what you think of this. Well, I guess Rivals, it's the same thing I say every week about the show. It's a nice bowl of potato chips for a wrestling fan. They don't have time to go too deep, and the panel uh, with Freddie Prinze Jr. and whoever they, I guess, rope into sitting there and talking about something that they usually weren't involved in just takes time away from it, but you like seeing the highlights and the old the old rivalries of, uh, you know, rehashed a little bit with the guys involved in it doing some of the talking. And it, it follows the same basic pattern every week where they give you a little, a little history package, some highlights of each of the, the participants in the, in the deal, you know, takers history in the 
WWF and and how they said he morphed into a more well-rounded sports entertainer. <laughs> And then, you know, Michaels, uh, 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 briefly, but the same through the mid-90s there, and you get Michael Hayes' comments that, yeah, Shawn Michaels was a prick. And Taker said, I didn't care for him personally. And, of course, Bruce Pritchard just eviscerates him with, well, Shawn's talent outweighed his attitude. <laughs> Ridiculous. Yeah, I, I'm daring Bruce to say something in any way abrasive or con confrontational or controversial or anything except the general con that he puts in front of him. Just a take. Just have a take. Have an opinion. Yeah, and shave your neck. Well, it, you know, it's hard to reach around a fucking head that size. Now, come on, be fair. He's hey, He has had shoulder surgery. So, I, I love the footage in this one of the because that was, you were right, the first go-round, SummerSlam 97 was Taker and Brett with Shawn Michaels as referee. And I thought, was, was that when they'd even used Highway to Hell? I can't remember. It, it was always cooking. That year was, was good for pay-per-view because you had so many guys that you could interchange at the top. Undertaker, Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, uh, Mick Foley and his uh, guises. You know, and, and and those guys were having great fucking matches, right? And in this one, it, it, this is an example of how Vince would guide what he wanted. Vince McMahon, I'm talking about. He'd guide what he wanted, give you the framework, and then he would throw things open for discussion. Because we talked about it before, you know, if Vince had to approve everything, if he said... I want this to happen this way, and you came up with a finish where that didn't happen that way. You're just wasting your fucking time. And he wanted, because of this, the dynamic at the time was that Brett and Sean disliked each other. We know that. And it was the Hart Foundation and the bizarro world where Brett was being cheered in Canada and booed in America for being an honorable guy and Sean and Triple H, the the goddamn assholes were being cheered by the American audience because Americans are all assholes too. And and so they have no love for each other. But meanwhile, the goddamn Undertaker is not known for, you know, playing patty cake with anybody. And the WWF title's on the line. So this one, what's going to happen and, and who's going to fuck who, right? That, you always want the fans to ask questions. They're doing the same thing now 25 years later with the bloodline. Who's going to fuck who, who's, et cetera. And so Vince said he wanted, when Sean was the referee between Brett and Undertaker, some way or another, Sean goes to fuck uh, Brett. Well, now, wait a minute. How is it now? Goddamn, I've lost it. Sean goes when, to fuck Brett accidentally she, fucks The Undertaker. Yes, yes, when Sean goes to fuck Brett, he fucks The Undertaker and then is in the position of referee and has to fucking count it, which is going to not only set up Sean and Taker for the next month, which was Hell in a Cell, Bad Blood, or no, in October, but it was going to be Taker and Sean in October, in September in Louisville. I'll get it in a minute. <laughs> August was SummerSlam. September was Taker and Sean in Louisville for the first time ever. And then October was the rematch. It had bad blood with Hell in a Cell. So the point is, Vince just wants Sean to goddamn fuck Taker when he's trying to fuck Brett. And... He's over. Then he he would open the floor. Well, it can't be a goddamn super kick because they we can't f fuck the Undertaker with one super kick, right? Well, what about if he's got a chair? Well, then somebody else says, "Well, what is he just going to go get the chair in front of the? Why is he doing that? He's the rev. Well, what about if he takes the chair away? He's trying to stop Brett from using the chair because he's the referee and he grabs it." Well, then why would he just whack Brett over the fucking... Well, Brett fucking gives him the fake. Well, he can't do that, but Brett spits at him. Okay, these are ideas that go around the fucking room, right? 
And then the basic thing is worked out okay. Uh, Brett will go get a chair and he's going to fuck Undertaker up, but Sean's the referee and he takes it away from him because he don't like Brett anyway. And they have words and Brett spits in Sean's face and Sean says, well, fuck you. But as he swings, Brett moves and Taker stands up and fucking Sean clobbers Taker. And then go, oh, fuck. And then Brett covers him and is looking like I'm the referee. And then, oh, fuck. One, two, and, and then the boys took it and put together the whole goddamn match from there. And that, you know, was what they did. And then that led to, as I said, the Louisville pay-per-view in September was the first time ever for The Undertaker to face Shawn Michaels. But did you notice, Brian, they did it in the Louisville Gardens and not Freedom Hall? Because that was still at that awkward point in the mid-90s where they had not become... Uh, overly confident that they were going to still fill the big buildings like they had been. So that was one of the, the only times that a major pay-per-view like that, uh, it was February 96. They did one or yes, February 96 and September 97. They did their pay-per-views in Louisville from the gardens, not freedom hall. Are you there by the this way? This has been Louisville wrestling history. Well, I'm just telling you, I'm Bill Butel. Um, but then, so then that goes to St. Louis in October and then it's Taker and Sean, but there comes Kane and you've got the great match highlights again. And they ended that, that match, as we talked about without a clear win winner so that they could revisit it, which they did again. And, and again, Kane appears and causes Taker to lose at the rumble 98, but that's when Sean hurts his back, and after WrestleMania, he's gone away for a few years. And then, you know, I hate every everybody that says now that always couldn't stand Michael says, oh, but he's much better now. I'd like to think that. I hope he is. I still don't really want to seek him out to fucking spend any time with him, but hopefully he's not a miserable son of a bitch like he used to be. That's the nicest thing you've ever said about him. Well, it's, you know, because look at he's aging. We might not have much longer left to say these things while he's around. Here's another motherfucker, by the way. Sexy boy, boy toy, playgirl centerfold. Look at you now, look at me now. I ain't changed a goddamn bit. Well, maybe a little bit, but you've changed a lot of bit. See, all these people are falling apart. They made deals with the devil. Have you seen... <laughs> Leaf Garrett these days? <laughs> Where are you? I have not seen him recently. I seen what, him uh, a little while back. What about Peter Frampton? You seen his fucking bald ass these days? Well, he seems to be embracing it. He has hearing problems right now, but good, yeah. good, 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 good. I hope he can't hear a thunder. I'm finally getting my revenge. I'm in better shape than all these. Well, hold on, you and Shawn Michaels had issues. What problem do you have with Leaf Garrett or Peter Frampton? If you were 16 in 1977, you'd have a problem with them, too. Fucking pricks getting all the goddamn attention. Did you ever want to grow your hair? Did you ever want long, flowing hair? Is that the no, problem? No, because I would have looked ridiculous. That's part of the problem. At least I was responsible <laughs> enough back then to know that I would have looked ridiculous because everybody, whether they looked ridiculous or not, had that hair back then because they didn't know that they looked ridiculous. But I was aware what I would look ridiculous in before I fucking got in it. So no, I never had fucking long hair down to my goddamn crotch like that. Were you into women who had the uh, Farrah Fawcett? Uh, yes, I was. They had the Farrah Fawcett hairdo. What do they call it? The uh, feathered hair? Let me tell you something. I was into enough women. They didn't even have to have hair when I was 16. Oh, what, Anywhere. What, what kind of fucking joke is that? That's disgusting. Well, I'm just, I'm just telling you. <laughs> When I was 16 in 1977, they did, hair was negotiable. All the, women, all, the, all, the women, all the women you had when you were 16. In no, I'm saying all, the, all the, the women in the world were optional at that point. I would have not, not uh, fucking resisted anything. But anyway, <laughs> speaking of resisting, <laughs> so they, they resisted heaven... 
Michaels and Taker until uh, for a few more years until Undertaker determined that he liked him at this point. And then finally, they do it at the, the Rumble again in whatever year. And where Michaels and Taker were the last two and had a nice long confrontation. And then WrestleMania 2009, there had never been a conclusive winner. There had always been some kind of fuck finish. Taker had never beaten Sean. And they brought up a good point. Michaels was 6 and 11 at WrestleMania. Mr. WrestleMania, the showstopper. But he lost more than he won. But it would surprise you, like it probably just did a number of people, to hear that, you know, said out loud. But it's it, if you do it right, and the guy that never wanted to put anybody over loses more than he wins at WrestleMania and, pr and proves himself wrong. Is that ironic? So like rain on your wedding day? That's I've not, that no, no you, we, you have said that, and that's not irony. Well, what else is irony in that song? It's like Coors Light on a rain. Is she singing song? about I, I don't know what she's Light? I, I don't know the words to Alanis Morris' set song. Well, you're the one. Going in the for a drive on a sunny day. You don't know where the Burlington Coat Factory is. Now you don't know the words to Isn't It Ironic by Alanis Morrissey. Buying lemon and chives on your wedding day. Being outside on the day of the seventh game. I don't know what, I don't know the lyrics. <laughs> so Michael Hayes tells the story of telling The Undertaker that, they, that he and Michael's his match was on fifth of ten at WrestleMania. And I had forgotten about that. And when I heard that, is that true? Is that a, an exaggeration or an outright lie? Because I can't imagine. And, the, of course, the story they told here was they decided, well, we'll fucking get even with these motherfuckers, put a five of ten, and not let anybody follow it. And they had an incredible match that people remember to this day, but was it fifth of ten? I think they were telling the truth, yeah. Well, that's goddamn. I can't, I'm not surprised they made Michael Hayes the one to tell Taker because they figured, well, fuck, either way it goes, they'll do us a favor of some kind. They'll either do it like we ask or they'll just get rid of Michael for us. Hey, knowing Vince's mental games with people, especially top stars, is this a motivational thing? What could have? What was on top of that? Do you have a lineup? Is uh, there a lineup printed anywhere? Give me a second. I'll get it. If you can find that, because just so folks, so you know why we're so gobsmacked here. I learned this when, when I first started keeping my book in Mid South Wrestling, and Bill Watts was a promoter that you could learn this well from. How fur? How fur you were? How far you were from the top of the card? indicated uh, where your payoff was going to be and how you were being used by the promotion. The closer you were to the main event and the further you were from the first match, the more prominent you were, the more money you were going to make, the more that you were going to be given credit if the house, the gate was up, ticket sales were up, however you term it, and the more solidly you were figured in. And so especially on all big shows like the Superdome or a big show in Houston or Oklahoma City or later on with the Great American Bashes in the Carolinas, when I would look at the card the way that Dusty Rhodes or Bill Dundee, whoever the booker was, wrote it from the top down, starting with the main event, I would note who the Midnight Express's opponents were and where we were on the card. If we were seven of nine at the Great American Bash or six of seven at the Superdome, I would know, or main event, even best yet, I would know what our pay might look like and how we were being figured in in, in terms of the booker's opinions. Go, do you have anything, Brian, by now? According to Wikipedia, WrestleMania 25, and no one else has anything they've confirmed as the official order of events, and I don't have the show in front of me, according to Wikipedia, it was seventh of nine matches. So if we go just based on the fact that it has to be somewhere in there, Two matches above it, Triple H defeating Randy Orton for the WWE Championship, and John Cena defeating The Big Show and Edge with Vicky and Chavo in a triple threat match for the 
World Heavyweight Championship. <laughs> Other than that, you got Ray versus Layfield, Matt Hardy versus Jeff Hardy, Jericho versus Snooker, Steamboat, and Piper, Santino Morella versus. Oh, no, it was a Miss WrestleMania Battle Royal. Won by Santino Morella. Oh, good Lord. A Money in the Bank match with CM Punk and the Colognes versus Morrison and The Miz. Well, then their story may have been a bit apocryphal, but the point is I don't see anybody following this thing anyway from, from that uh, lineup that you read. It was a great match, and it was so good that they brought it back the following year as the way to retire Michaels, putting the streak up against the career, and they had another banger, as they say in the uh, in the industry these days. Another banger and, and great highlights. Have you noticed when Michaels threw a super kick, it looked good? It didn't look like, you know, children playing slap and tickle with each other. It looked like it might knock you down. It got better over time. Early on, it looked a little rough, but yeah, it looked good here. By this point, he mastered it. And, uh, I mean, you just you, you see the people jumping up and down, reacting better. You see the work in the ring looking better. And it, uh, again, a, a nice little bowl of potato chips looking back at the old days, but it depresses me for why the shit looks so lacking in emotion and violence and intensity uh, for the most part, <laughs> even when it really is fucking dangerous uh, when compared with long ago. And did you see the one shot of when Michaels comes through the gorilla position after the retirement match there among the people applauding is Vince McMahon. And this was, what year was that? Oh, Michael's just, retirement, the second... I just closed it. Hold on, hold it on. It just closed it. Well, it was, it was 2009, wasn't it? Was it 9 or 10? It was 10. WrestleMania 26 was 2010. Okay, so that's 14 years ago. Vince is 78 now, we've been told, right? So he was 64 years old there. His arms looked as thick around as... Michael's his legs. He was. It, it was like he was. Was he working or doing something on that fucking program, or was he? Did he just get a pump on to go sit at Gorilla with a headset? Well, you know, it's been said that Vince uh, loves steroids. It's been said. It's been said. He said it at different points. <sighs> it's been said that frogs love lily pads. Did you know that if a it's frog been said, isn't it ironic? You, isn't it ironic? Well, there. You, if if a frog pisses on you, you'll get warts. Did you know that? I did not know that. That's Mama Cornette used to tell me that all the time when I was a kid, and I'd I'd find a frog outside and I'd bring it in to play with it. I've never seen a frog Jimmy, piss. Don't do that. Well, they'll if you hold them up long enough and you hold them the wrong way, they'll piss on you. They get they get pissed about it. There's no pun intended. But then every time the frog would piss on me, she'd make me wash my hands so I didn't get warts. Funny enough, I was just reading an article that Brock Lesnar has a giant collection of frogs. <sighs> Do you know what we missed out because of Brock Lesnar not being able to say no to the ravings and lustings of a perverted, senile billionaire? We, got, we missed Gunther versus Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania. That's what it was going to be. So you're the one that likes to pee. It would have been great promos. Well, especially with Gunther being from that part of the world. What part of the world? Germany, Austria. <laughs> it, I'm just... It, 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 they you, may have... You, you know what? They like they, pee. I don't know what you're saying. They, yeah, I, I, are you out of your mind? Are you serious? I'm, I, I'm telling you, I can't <laughs> believe... It. They, they've got the German videos over there with the bodily functions, probably at the goddamn neighborhood 7-Eleven. You can probably oh. check them out of the public library. From what I understand, the Germans love their bodily functions, love their their uh, their scheisen and their their peacen. All right, well, uh, that was the rivalry of Sean and the Undertaker. Well, it certainly was a rivalry like no other.
What do you think the odds are, Brian, that we're going to get a lot of emails about uh, your ignorance to the modern German video atmosphere? First of what all, do you think the odds are? I think the odds are zero. Uh, there will be zero emails sent in about that. You don't know anything about the modern German scene. You're talking about whatever the scene was when you were out on the street. Well, no, I'm I'm tapping. I was out on the street, homeless, as if <laughs> peddling these videos from door to door. No, I'm talking about the the modern, you know, after like F.W. Murnau. After after that era of cinema, there's there was a whole new era of German cinema that. It came up and it it took over there for about uh, a significant period of time, a few decades there with the advent of home video. Most people couldn't go to see videos like this out in the theaters. They preferred them to come home to them. But uh, Germany is the place to go. It's the detail that you seem to have ready to go that scares me about all this. Well, because I, I had a transition ready to go. Now I can't remember what it was. Hey, folks, if you're not interested in watching Germans poop on each other... The odds. You asked me about the odds. The ah, odds. What, are, what are the odds that you're interested or not interested in watching German people poop on each other, but you might be interested in betting on March Madness and the, the college basketball tournament? Well, uh, there's got to be... you got to be interested in one or the other. I would think that any person who's either a fan of the college basketball tournament but doesn't like German pooping videos or vice versa, but you got to fit one of those two descriptions, don't you, Brian? There are so more, this is, I'm really no, speaking no, to everyone. No, you're not speaking really to that many people when you're speaking to this specific audience. College basketball, maybe. The weird stuff in the Jim Cornette video collection, not so much. Well, I'd, I'd just say, and you know, wh whatever you, description you fit, Folks, if you'd like the thrill and excitement of the college basketball tournament season to come crashing down around your ears, get right in the middle of it with DraftKings Sportsbook. It's one of America's top-rated sportsbook apps. I don't know their current rating, but it's on top. And they're right now giving new customers a chance to turn $5 into $150 instantly in bonus bets with any basketball bet that you make on the college tournament. And, right, it's, of course, North Carolina, that's big for college basketball. DraftKings Sportsbook is now live in your state. It's encroaching on states all over the country now. You know, in some places, you can still be pilloried in the public square for downloading the DraftKings Sportsbook app, but not in most civilized places at this point. And did we mention that if you use the code JCE, when you download the DraftKings Sportsbook app, that's how you get the $150 instantly in bonus bets for betting only $5 on one of these college hoops games. Do not bet on the University of Louisville. We've mentioned that before. They've just fired their latest head coach, and they're searching the world for another dumbass that's completely incompetent that can lose more games than he could ever possibly hope to make up for. So don't bet on them. They're not even in the tournament, I bet. I've been too disgusted to even look. Nobody would ask these assholes, the University of Louisville Basketball Cardinals, to their tournament. But you know what they would ask? They'd ask for the DraftKings Sportsbook phone number. And you can only get that by downloading the app. Do they have a phone number, Brian, over at DraftKings Sportsbook? They have a wonderful app you can download and connect to with our... Promo code, I believe it is, or promo... Yes, yes, JCE. You can connect with the app. They don't really have a phone number because they well, they used to have an office and a phone booth, but then the the opposing mob got smart to where they were and the, there was a drive-by. But anyway, folks, download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use the code JCE. $5 gets you $150. 4 gets you 8 8 will get you 20 and murder will get you life. With the DraftKings Sportsbook app, though, the crown is yours. And if you have a problem with gambling or German videos, call 1-800-GAMBLING. Gambling, just gambling. Well, you can call 1-800-SCHEISEN. Call 1-800-GAMBLER, or in West Virginia, visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY, or text HOPE-NY. 
1-800-467-4673-467-369. In Connecticut, help is available. For problem gambling, call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpcopybrokeoff.org. Please play responsibly on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas. But we're not in Kansas anymore. 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. So the clock is ticking, ladies and gentlemen. See dkng.com slash bball for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsibility of gaming responsible gaming resources there b-ball b-ball well we teased everybody at the top of the program that if you like the classic wrestling folks we're going to have some for you today plenty of classic wrestling going all the way back because there is a new book out that if it's not my favorite uh, professional wrestling book i've ever read it's close to it and brian you felt the same way and naturally With both of us being like-minded, we had to hunt down the author and grill him extensively for the Cult of Cornette audience. That is indeed right, and that is also indeed a transition to me over here. And I'll let everyone know that is what we did. We spoke with John Langmead, the author of the brand new book, Ballyhoo. And I moved the book into the other room, so I don't remember (laughs) the con artist... Real life criminals, no scallywags <laughs> and frogs, Scally, scallywags and and, and retro, reprobates <laughs> and and Monty Banks. Well, you will hear the full title of it, and of course, if you listen to the show, we will have a link to buy it on Twitter. But there have been a lot of stories written over the years, in real time, and then of course in various books about the characters that helped found American pro wrestling, or pro wrestling as we call it it's not always easily digestible and a lot of people know the names and they really don't know exactly what anyone did or how it happened i think this book jim did a better job than anything else before it and making it easy to understand the origins of wrestling history i agree well let's see uh he's i'm sure john lang means going to agree too but let's go now to the conversation the author of ballyhoo John Langmead. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the time has come here on the experience. We're going to go to school. We're going to go to the College of Wrestling Knowledge because we have the author of what I dare say may be my favorite book ever written on professional wrestling because this is, it's the Fall Guys written in modern language, ladies and gentlemen. Ballyhoo, the roughhousers, con artists, and wild men who invented professional wrestling by John Langmead. It is a book on not only the origin of the wrestling business that we have all come to love at some stage or another, but some of the most fascinating characters to exist in American sports or entertainment history and We welcome him to talk about all of these people and so many more. John Langmead. John, thank you for being here. Thank you. It is an incredible honor, and I am so, so happy to be talking with you. So thanks for having me. When I read this book, when when it was over with or when I finished it, I was pissed because there wasn't any more because I wanted more. I I read like an idiot. I read the notes in the back, right? This is so well-researched. You've got... 40 pages of notes, chapter by chapter in the back, and and they're fascinating. But let me ask you this question, because I've talked to Tim Hornbaker, who's done those incredible history books, and we've talked to Brian Solomon, who's part of our little extended family here. And I say the same thing, the research, not only the job of research, but the the patience that you had to have to undergo it. But in this case, it is so I mean, th- this book pops these people to life in your mind like you're reading a book on P.T. Barnum or you're reading a book on Florence Ziegfeld. But was it always your intention to, even though they're all here, the the big hits, the Toots Mons, the Strangler Lewises, was it your intention going in to focus on Jack Curley or did that evolve as you started to learn more? Because he may be the most fascinating one of the bunch. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, 
Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So it was, you know, it wasn't my intention going in. My intention going in was just like, I think like everybody who, who researches this, Tim, Brian, all the guys I mentioned in the book, like, I think we're just interested in that era. Like I wanted to know more. And then when the idea of kind of writing a book kind of was coming along, I was like, well, how could I structure this? Cause I wanted to, I, I appreciate what you said. Like, I mean, that was my goal, right. Was to like, how do I hook people with this? And not only wrestling people, but people that might not be have any interest in wrestling, who might just have a general interest. Like, how do I make this a great story for people? Over time, I was kind of like, I had to have a character. I had to have somebody I could kind of put this on. And that name, Jack Curley, just came up over and over. Like, anytime you look up wrestling from this era, it's pretty rare that you're not going to come across Jack Curley's name in one way or another. So he just seemed like the perfect character. And it kind of was like, good for me, maybe bad for him. Like his life just aligned perfectly with like the era that I was personally interested in. Like, you know, that, that turn of the century right up through if people haven't read the book, the 1937, uh, the, the, the trial that happens in Columbus, Ohio, um, where wrestling is effectively put on trial and like, you know, the national courts, like he's, he's there everywhere you go. Jack Curley is there. He's at Gotch Hackenschmidt. He's, Jim Landis, you know, working with Jim Landis, he works with Strangler Lewis. He's at the trial. He's everywhere. So the, the Jack Johnson apparent. fight, he was like perfect. The, Jack, the Johnson. Jack Johnson fight. I mean, this is exactly. a guy who may very well, if things had gone differently, been one of the great boxing promoters that you would be writing a book on now. But he was more suited, and happenstance took him to wrestling. But this is like a. It, 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 like you said, a turn of the century, both late 1800s, early 1900s, a uh, history lesson on some of the most famous incidents in in American history. And this guy is, is uh, popping up in the middle of it and goes on to basically set the blueprint for how to promote professional wrestling that evolved in one way or another for the next hundred years. I, I agree with that completely. I mean, and that was what I was so interested in is I think by like, and you can please tell me if you feel differently, but like by the 1920s, I kind of feel like, and especially the 1930s, no doubt, like wrestling matches were pretty much set. Like, it, it, I don't know that they changed all that much up and through. I mean, I think by the nineties and the two thousands, they had things had changed, but like through the early eighties, I think you could, Obviously, matches were longer. Guys didn't jump off the top rope. Things were different in that respect. But I think the idea of the template had basically been set by then. And I think that Curly had a gi gigantic hand in making that happen. Um, but, yeah, I was just so interested in that era. I was so interested in the people. I mean, what, as I was kind of researching this and working on it, like those guys, Curly, Londa, Gus Sonnenberg, like they felt – very alive to me. And I just wanted to really, I, I hope that comes across for people because that was really my goal was how to make these guys feel as alive as any wrestler today. Well, you know, that's the thing is that I mentioned, you know, they pop out at you because, you know, I'm a big reader, always have been. And I love, you know, biographies of famous people that were in any genre or form of, you know, endeavor that I'm kind of interested about. And you know, these uh, people are such unique, as Mama Cornette used to say, boy, what characters they are. They're <laughs> such unique people that they could be, and this doesn't have to be a book about wrestling, it, it, it is because that was their line of work, but the stories, the way they did things, the way that they conducted themselves, the peculiar, the Jack Pfeffers of, I mean, how do you, you can't write that. Right. It has to be real and you report on it. You can't make these things up. And I think it's, just, it's fascinating. Americana is is what I'm saying. Well, what I wanted to do, I mean, I appreciate that. What I wanted to do was put this. I really wanted to focus on like put it in their terms on us. How are fans thinking about wrestling? How are the promoters thinking? Try And that's why I, I think I leaned so heavily on trying to quote them directly. Um and, you know, and it, and it was as you go, like, as you look at the newspapers from that era, these guys are in there a lot. They're interviewed. They're, the, the reporters are quoting them. So it wasn't a huge chore necessarily to find quotes that, that I could kind of use um, throughout the book. But I wanted to make it feel very much from that era and not take a perspective of, like, looking back at it and judging right. it or, you know what I mean? So I really tried hard on that. And I'll say 
to your point, like the thing for me that really, when this clicked for me and I kind of felt like I knew what I was kind of what the story was when I, for me personally, like I play music on the side, I play drums for a bunch of different bands. I've, you know, been in touring bands. I kind of have a sense of what that life is like. Like that's what these guys felt like to me. Like they were entertainers on the road, athletes, entertainers on the road, living that life, trying to make a living as traveling entertainers um, with all the good and the bad that comes from that life. You know, going to different towns, trying to get people to show up, buy a ticket to come see them perform. Uh, and once I kind of had a sense of them in that respect, that just the, the story just kind of went from there. Well, and then the, the analogy is kind of like for the average wrestlers, they were, like you said, going from town to town, traveling entertainers. For the the bigger wrestlers, they were the guys that were on the top of the bill at, in vaudeville, which was the number one live entertainment forum in the country at the time, except the the main event guys, the Strangler Lewis's and et cetera, they were, they were on Broadway. They were making the big money. <laughs> right. Right. And, and you mentioned the newspapers and we'll go back to that because that's what they, even before radio, much less before television, that was the way that you promoted the fact that anything was going to happen. If you were, trying to draw a crowd, trying to make people aware of something, everybody read the newspaper. And as a result, that's what any wrestling or sports promoter or show promoter, they wanted to put the posters up around town. They wanted to get in the newspaper. And if they had to, as you report in some cases, I believe in the book, they would pay to get, you know, some publicity. <laughs> there were all kinds of deals going on where in the old days, before radio, before television, before there was any other way to do it these sports writers for boxing promoters wrestling promoters if you were on the new york daily news sports desk you could make some better money from the people you were writing about than the stuff you were writing the company you were writing for but the point is that's where i was going with that is since they were in the newspapers constantly and the main event world title wrestling matches were reported like the world boxing championship and these guys were celebrities when you couldn't, you know, make a dime playing football. And so I guess what I'm asking you is when you go back to that era, do you think that was the time when wrestling was most mainstream in this country, the pioneer days from the early 1900s through the days of Londos, when everybody was exposed to them? Every fan says that, when wrestling goes through a hot period, oh, wrestling's hotter than it's ever been. No, it's only hotter than it's ever been since you've been alive, right? <laughs> but, I, I think totally, totally. Were, no, were, these, guys, were these guys in, in from the 1900s to the 1930s as professional wrestlers, were they the biggest stars to the public at large that they have ever been in the last, in, since the in, invention of the business? I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I would say, I think so. So everything you said, I completely, com com completely agree with. So, I mean, these guys were sports stars and I think what's cool, you know, not to jump all around, but you know, people have this kind of thought that like somehow everybody took wrestling, everybody bought wrestling hook, line and sinker. They all thought it was real. Jack Pfeffer exposed that that ruined the business, right? Like that's none of that's really true. Like, sports writers covered wrestling. I mean, you can go to a newspaper and you can any pick any day from 1920 or whatever. You're going to find articles right. about professional wrestling. You can look at the Joe Stecker Earl Caddick match that happened in 1920 in Madison Square Garden. The, the New York Times, the New York Times had like, they practically dedicated a whole page to, to writing about that match. They took it, they took it seriously to a certain degree, I think everybody had a healthy degree of skepticism about professional wrestling, and there were plenty of matches, and there's plenty of examples where, like, you know, that match was a put on, that match was a fake, that match was legitimate. There was a, some, some, some kind of. I think people there was chicanery, but you know, chicanery <laughs> is a good word for it. But what I what you see that's really interesting is not just the New York Times. By the time of Jim London, he's in the New Yorker, he's in Vanity Fair, he's in these gigantic public uh, uh, magazine, mainstream magazines that are covering him with a certain degree of seriousness. It really isn't until like 
the 1940s, 1950s, and I think you and I actually may have spoken about this in the past, that wrestling goes out of all – nobody writes about wrestling anymore by the time you're in the 1960s. It's only covered in certain newspapers in certain towns, but the, the more mainstream areas uh, – publications really write about it but back then they were all covering them like major 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 sports heroes well, Frank you know, yeah, and, was probably and the most famous athlete in the country yeah because he was an individual rather than a part of a team or a racehorse because horse racing was even bigger back then but you mentioned the the exposés and etc and you can go back and to the early 1900s and you'll see sports writers and you could tell who was getting paid some were glowing and some were talking about it but <laughs> holding their nose right but there was totally. always the, the skepticism and the speculation, is it or isn't it? That's why the question persisted for so many years. Curiosity over what was going on fed a lot of that. When in New York, and Brian and I have covered, you know, that whole era on this show often, when Pfeffer went out of his way to find somebody who also wanted to go out of his way to just blister wrestling, it killed it in New York. Not even necessarily but it, it, the people that they confirmed that the suspicions, that was bad enough, but they blistered it. We've talked about it for the next 15 years in any of the English-speaking media in New York, wrestling was hooted at. That's why that Vince Sr. and the Precursors had such success with Rocca or Bruno, the the ethnic hero with that population, because the sports writers in New York were pissing on the business. And and think, but you you find that in different places of, uh, around the country through the years, though. But in, until I get, I'm going to sum this up. Until we, as a wrestling industry, the promoters and the wrestlers threw our hands up and said. Fuck it, you've been right all along. Everything's bullshit. That's when the speculation ended, and that's when the the interest ended, and that's when a lot of interest ended. Well, we've uh, the con man with the shell game. You can say, hey, that guy on the corner, don't play that shell game with him. He's fucking crooked, but I can beat him. But if the con man playing the shell game tells you I'm crooked, I'm gonna fuck you. Well, okay. I, I I think people don't like to do I think what happened, and I, I agree with everything you're saying, I think people felt like suckers. I think that they felt, I think yes. that that happened in the early 19th, end of the 1930s, early 1940s, is they felt like, people felt like they were being laughed at a little bit by yeah. everybody. The promoters thought they were suckers. The athletes thought they were suckers. And they kind of felt foolish. And then I think that the sports writers and the newspapers really added to that. Um so I think that really killed it in a lot because people didn't want to feel that way. They didn't want to go and feel like they were being made fun of by it, by the people they were paying money to go see necessarily. So I think, but what I think is so interesting about that, and you totally put hit the nail on the head, I think, is this, that is it, isn't it? People played with that a lot, I think, and the promoters played with that a lot. And I think that's that's something that I think people don't really appreciate this idea that if they think everybody took it completely seriously back then, because I think the promoters knew early on part of the appeal of wrestling was kind of almost this like postmodern thing where it was like playing around with that. Like, was that real or was that not? People love part of the appeal of going to a wrestling match was seeing if you could spot when it was fake and when it wasn't. And that's absolutely, I, that's been talked about plenty in the media from the 1930s. The part of it was seeing if you could see through the match. Um, the, pr the, the promoters would say, well, if you think this, come and see for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> that that's exactly it had like that Barnum-esque kind of thing for it right is are you smart enough to kind of spot the fake for sure well and and also with the with the early years um the very early years of of the pro game a lot of money was made on gambling betting and that's why they had those five-hour extravaganza. Oh, I, I bet he's going to get him in the next 10 minutes. Oh, you think so? <laughs> that type of thing. Because there were no, there were really no sports arenas to speak of in this country in those days. And they, for the boxing championship fights, they had to make their own goddamn wooden outdoor arenas and fields to hold people. <laughs> and so they had to keep because this was criminal activity, right? When you're fixing betting and all that stuff. And they got run out of more than one town as a result of it. But later on, when it became 
just as lucrative, if not more so, for the promoters and the wrestlers to actually just sell tickets to watch what we do and, and you know, gambling, you know, optional, tip optional, whatever, then it really became bigger to where you had, and this is what I wanted to speak to you about. You talk about the newspaper coverage. You had Jim Londos or you had the major name, you know, Pickett, uh, Lewis, Shikat, whatever, putting 30,000 people in the rudimentary baseball stadiums of the day when there was there were no interstates, there was no commercial air travel to speak of, and in the middle of the Depression. And they would get that many people to come and see what the fuck they were going to do. It's, it's, it's a marvel that you can motivate that many people, even in those days, under those conditions, to come out. And as a result, I think you, you can make a case that those guys were, were the most at the top were the most compensated athletes of any kind in the, in the world, uh, judging for inflation, maybe still in the, in the wrestling business today. I mean, I think you're probably right. I mean, if you look at, so by the, by the time of rest, wrestling kind of goes through the doldrums a little bit in the 1920s in certain areas, not in all areas, but by the end, when you get Gus, Gus Sonnenberg kind of reignites the fire a little bit, you can see selling out, you know, the Boston arena, Week after week, that's what's amazing to me, is they would sell out some of these places every week. So it was like what you later you see that like in the Mid-South Coliseum, right? Like when they were like selling out for whatever, you know, 10 years in a row. But they were doing that in the early 1930s, late 1920s. And you get no no TV, very little radio. No. And what's one 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 kind of. A story that kind of highlights that is the Dan O'Mahony match in Boston when he uh, he wrestled. Now I'm not going to forget. The, now I'm saying I'm going to completely blank on the name. But Jim Braddock had won the. He was a boxing heavyweight champion for a period in 1934. I think he won the championship. But he the week after he wins the heavyweight championship, he goes to referee a Dan O'Mahony match in Boston, and Dan O'Mahony outdraws the Jim Braddock heavyweight championship <laughs> match for Jim Braddock. Right. So I mean, I think that that is if anything illustrates that is that boxing could, at certain points could actually outdraw, I'm sorry, wrestling could actually outdraw boxing, heavyweight boxing, which was um, the, the major sport of the 1920s. You know, Jim Londa's practically sold out Yankee stadium uh, for a match with Ray Steele at the height of his popularity. I mean, these guys were drawing massive, massive, massive crowds week after week after week. It wasn't a one-off. It was not a one-off phenomenon. This was happening all over the country during that period. Well, and this was before, Obviously, the territories were formed per se, and the major promoters would hook up with anybody anywhere to do something to make money. And so it was a situation where Londos didn't have to work seven nights a week. He could take these big matches. He drew wherever he went. He could pick his spots in, in most cases. And again, the the money adjusted for today's inflation rate, et cetera, and today's money, as the kids say. I don't know that there's another era where the until maybe today with these guaranteed tens of millions of dollars, because you can, you know, draw from so many revenue streams. But wrestling, whereas whereas the payroll and the salaries in other professional sports continued to increase at a steady rate. The, the top guys in the 30s were making a fortune. The top guys in the 50s were still making more money than most people. And the top guys in the seventies started getting left behind by the fucking baseball and football players. It, it somehow we, we didn't stay ahead of that curve. Yeah. And I, I'll say what's inter- what one thing that interests me in the, in, and I hope people get this from the book too, is that era. What I find interesting to bring back Jack Curley a little bit is that he and some of the other promoters of the day, I mean, they were building modern sports, kind of what you said. I mean, at the time that wrestling was getting going, Professional baseball was just getting off the ground. Professional football was like barely even like a a glint in the eye of people. College football was still kind of the main thing. Professional basketball was barely getting off the ground. So wrestling and boxing were like the big, big, big sports at the time in the late 1800s. And I love what you said. I mean, that, that sort of seat of your pants promotion. I mean, that was the model. You go out in a field and you build a gigantic wooden arena 
uh, Jack Early was like at the at the forefront of that. He promotes the Jack Johnson fight. You know, people are they're still banging down boards and trying to get the ring set up by the time the paying customers are coming in. You know, so it was this incredible seat of your pants thing. But it's incredible to me how by the era you're talking about in the 1930s and the Jim Londis and Madison Square Garden and every major city has a gigantic arena that happened so fast. I mean, that happened over the course of the 1920s. But he's really at kind of the forefront of it. And by the time wrestling comes back in the 1930s, they're like ready to take advantage of all that. And it's the most popular sport in the country. It's absolutely to me. It was it's such a fascinating story. But I love like like what we were saying that seat of your pants kind of thing. And these guys kind of traveling over the country, and they were all around the country by car or by by train, just trying to make the show on time. And I just I love that kind of freewheeling like sense of sports because now sports are so organized and so you know commercialized but back then that just wasn't the case and it's such a neat era to to write about it's like looking at you know a wc fields movie the old-fashioned way where he's leading the the wandering troop of the you know the uh, stage players of the drunkard and he's trying to stay ahead of the sheriff and find you know, the investor to put on one show in one town so he can get the money to get to the next town. <laughs> you know, that's, totally. and for, I think for the same reason that I love the history of Hollywood from silence to the, the outbreak of sound or the history of vaudeville or early radio, it, these people were performers in whatever genre that were figuring out what to do in some case with a new medium or a new mode of expression from scratch and they had to just play it in front of people over and over and then with wrestling you compound that with the fact that it originated as the uh, you know uh, an offshoot of the old army game wink wink nod nod it's a fucking con it's a swerve and you're you're banking on playing with people's emotions to get them emotionally invested in in a conflict and on someone's side and willing to fork out some kind of money whether it's wagering on the outcome or just paying to see it and it's just to me and you've got to you've got to be a performance artist and an and a a monologuist and an uh, an incredible actor and a glib personality and an interesting person and you got to do that 24 hours a day I, that's not I, yeah, even I mean, a question. <laughs> no, it's not a question, but I will say you're, I mean, you're, you're, you're taking the words right out of my mouth. I mean, I will say, I hope in the book, one thing I can, I was able to accomplish, I hope is um, not to make that era feel too antiquated. Cause to me, it felt very modern and all of the stuff you're talking about it. Like, again, like I said, I, I, I think Jim Londis would have fit perfectly in 1980s WWF or NWA or whatever, because I mean, again, the, they were inventing this stuff in real time, and that's why I wanted to get that kind of word "inventing" in the title. Is it's like, I think Strangle Lewis. Now he was, they were building on what guys before them had done, for sure. But in the 1920s, you see him doing exactly what you said, getting these people emotionally invested in these matches, and then when the good guy loses, they're so angry, they're so upset, they like tear the arenas apart. You know, they're like throwing chairs at him and they're, you know, I think Wadig Zabisco gets bashed over the head with a chair when he's trying to run from the ring in 1917 because people want to kill him so bad. I mean, this stuff was, this is not new. I mean, these guys, but they were making that up. You just don't see that really in other sports. But I think they had a sense, as like you said, is like, I really do think of them as performance artists. And I, I, and it, I, it, I, it was, it was, it was emotional more than, then uh, obviously everybody hates when their favorite sports team wins, but they took it a step further. The, the people's favorite sports team was cheated. Maybe the referee didn't see it, but we saw it. God damn it. And this motherfucker. And th- they could engender that type of emotion, both positive or negative, that all the great bookers that followed in the, through the 80s and 90s um, d- you know, were able to do the same thing, maybe not with as rudimentary a performance. But in those days, a little went a long way, and then we did shit too much. But, but that, that's exactly what your, you know, your book brings that to life is that these people, they, they knew psychology of the American public, much as a P.T. Barnum or as any of the, you know, as a, any Hollywood 
uh, studio mogul. Louis B. Mayer knew what his American public was going to buy in the way of motion pictures. And they were able to give the, the baby face that, that out. Oh, he was cheated, if only so-and-so. And it was simple and it was believable, but the people would be you know, brought to a froth about it. And that necessitated a rematch. And then they began figuring out, well, we could do this, you know, on a more widespread basis and the programs and the territories and et cetera, all sprang from, we want to get people interested in this fight and how can we maximize the revenue involved in it? I'll, I'll drop his name just because I love talking about him and I love him so much. But Steve Yoey, who um, a few people, hopefully more people will know his name, but uh, a great, probably the in my mind, my favorite wrestling historian. I love him so much. But you, you, he, he can talk about this stuff for days. I mean, and he really goes into like, and this is where I was able to kind of learn from him from. It's about the booking angles and that you can see people think of booking angles that they were somehow invented by, I don't know, in the 1990s or something. They were booking <laughs> angles in 1915, 1914, no doubt. I mean, there's the thing that kind of sparked my imagination so much is I wanted, I think it was 1917, 1918, there was a match, Strangler Lewis and Jim Londis. And, you know, Strangler Lewis, people, Billy Sandow, his manager, is driving people nuts because he's instructing Strangler Lewis from from ringside. And, you know, you can see he invents this idea of like this bad, the bad guy manager. See, that's there in 1917. But in this particular match, you know, Jim Landis ties bends over to tie his shoe and Strangler Lewis rushes over and pins him unexpectedly. I mean, you think, I mean, that absolutely was something they worked out before that match. I have no doubt in my mind that they did that as a performance to infuriate the fans. And it it works perfectly. And all of this is in service of making sure there's a sellout next time they show up in town. And that just caught my imagination so much because that was what captured when I was in when I first got into wrestling in the, you know, 1984. That was what I loved about it is what, what, how what? it's like the best of movies, the best of, of sports, all that stuff all wrapped up into one. When I first started going to the matches in the 70s when I was a kid, I would say because, as and we've talked about here on the program also, that Tennessee was a direct pipeline to the to the pioneer days because Roy Welch was still a, a major force in the early 70s. He had started wrestling in 1930 and had, you know, he was the Southern Tootsmont. And I would see these finish where the heels would take the the soap and rub it in the eyes of the baby face or whatever the case, some type of cheap heel tactic that would bring people into a frenzy. And then our, our friend Scott Teal down in Nashville, it's done said crowbarpress.com folks. That's done such incredible research and, and did the book on Madison square garden is just incredible, but he do, he'll do Knoxville or he'll do Nashville or he'll do Amarillo, Texas. And you will see, <laughs> in the newspaper accounts of these matches, the same finishes I was seeing. If 40 years later, because they still worked, it made sense. The the bad guy pulled out a foreign object or he, he was, you know, busted open the good guy with a bottle or whatever the case. And, you know, they just made up shit as they went that they thought would get people's interest involved. And, you mentioned doing the uh, the newspaper research. When you go back it, it, to that era, you can see it, it's it, it raises questions because you can see these headlines like the you know the riot that so and so caused, which you know are legitimate in in most cases. But the police had to save the heel. But then also you see the police arrested the heel for disorderly conduct for hitting the baby <laughs> face over the head. And here's where you got to be a detective, right? Because both of these things have happened for real. It's happened that there was a local cop that was a friend of one of the guys that was smartened up even back then, and they would do an angle and put the heel in jail. And there was also cops that weren't smartened up that that arrested the fucking heel for cheating in the wrestling match. And you have to do your detective work, right, to... See, well, what was the time frame? And it was there a pattern of this? And I'm sure you went through that a lot. You know, and I'll say, too, I mean, to that point, I mean, I benefited so much. You mentioned Scott Peel. I mentioned CBO. We talked about Tim Hornbaker. But everybody, Greg Oliver, Steve Johnson, I mean, 
all the uh, Mark Hewitt. I know I don't, I don't want to leave anybody out, but I mean, all of these incredible historians that have spent the past couple decades doing a lot of that detective work. So I was able to, I really did benefit from that. You mentioned Scott's incredible Madison Square Garden. That was an incredible resource for me. Like Steve Dewey's book on Ed Lewis is an incredible resource for me, all of Tim's books. But to your point, right, I mean, you see not only the police, but doctors. There's a quote in uh, Ed Lewis has an unpublished biography that I was able to kind of get some access to. And he talks about fooling doctors. And he has a quote in there where he says, there's not as, not as, old time wrestler alive who couldn't basically fool a doctor into thinking they had a wrenched back or a, you know, a, a, a concussion and they needed to spend the night in the hospital so that they could get that in the newspapers the next day. And I wanted to make a point too to what we were talking about earlier is part of the thing in that era that I think they were able to infuriate the crowd so much was they had, cause the, 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 the crowd had come to love the baby face, right? Like, but they had to do that by going there Face to face, working the, the the fans week after week after week because they didn't have TV, they didn't have radio in the you know the 1910s to get people to know who these characters were, so that when Ed Lewis cheated against you know Jim Melendez or Joe Stecker or somebody, the fans were so emotionally invested in the good guy that they were infuriated that they lost. Like that that was something that they had to really bang out and make these fans believe, and they just did it. With just the sweat of their brow, you know, you're traveling around doing this week after week in front of people and just, yeah, I just, I can't, I couldn't get enough of it when I was working on this. And I'll, I'll make a couple shouts too, because not only to the books and the newspapers and stuff, but the no- Notre Dame has, there's incredible resources around for people interested in this area. The Notre Dame has the Jack Pfeffer collection, which is unbelievable. And what you see when you go and you can look at that like wrestling history comes to alive because you actually have the letters from wrestlers writing to Jack Pfeffer saying, can you please book me, you know, in the month of April, you you know, they write these crazy things. I have a mustache. I weigh 240 pounds. I go over great as a bad guy. Like, so they're looking for work and, and that's what this is. And it's just thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces of these correspondence, which just bring the air so completely to life. It's absolutely unbelievable. Well, and and I, by the way, I I don't know know if I ever even want to go to Hawaii or whatever. But before I die, I got to go see the Jack Pfeffer collection. So I'm I'm going to Notre Dame at some point, not to study. Well, I'm studying that. <laughs> but uh, but uh, you you go back to the uh, talking about the the newspapers and the th- that's uh, the Pfeffer collection is an example of stuff that was saved from inside the business because. You, when you're reading and researching newspapers, you're relying on what was reported, and in a business shrouded in secrecy, there wasn't a lot of inside paperwork, which makes Pfeffer all the more special because he saved everything because of the various issues he had going on with him. That someday we'll we'll get one of you guys do a book <laughs> just on Jack Pfeffer. But um, but point B. <laughs> So you had to separate some some fact from some fiction in the uh, in the in the newspapers and the and the various accounts. But at the same time, it does show you how they would get the. You mentioned the baby faces; they were so popular. Londos and, and being Greek, uh, you know, there's the the brief uh, glimpse or clips of him, you know, in front of. 100,000 people in his stadium in Greece because he became a national hero there because of the way that he got over here. The people loved these these heroes because they won more often than they lost. They always won cleanly. They were the all-American boys. And and they took, you know, evil, nasty cheaters to take them down, and people got behind that type. But as your book also chronicles whenever the wrestling promoters would get too full of themselves and go for somebody who had more eye appeal than he had actual wrestling ability that's when the double crosses came in and there was a plethora of those during the latter years of your book and that had to be fun to sit down and go through all the accounts and go my god i can't believe the the time and effort months were sometimes put in in these plots by wrestlers and their promoter to get a title match with a guy they wanted to fuck just so they could do it and get the belt back. Uh, yes. And I, I, you know, <laughs> one of the kind of central questions that I think I was kind of interested in is 
I think when I, so when I started this, I tried to really start, I really didn't know very much. I was kind of coming from a really naive place, but everything was kind of up for grabs as far as in my mind, as far as like commonly accepted wrestling knowledge. I believe me, I spent so many email exchanges with so many wrestling historians, you know, was it possible that the whole, I mean, I don't want to go too deep for people who haven't read the book yet, but who may not know, but you know, there's a pretty famous where Wayne Munn is a, he's a, a famous example. People write a lot about he was orchestrated to, to effectively win the heavyweight title from Strangler Lewis. Munn had practically no practical experience with wrestling, but was a looked good. He was a big guy. You know, people liked him. Uh, uh, he goes on this incredible winning streak and then Stanislaus Sabisco, who was, you know, a well-trained, well-known wrestler kind of goes off script and humiliates him in Philadelphia and wins the world heavyweight title and throws everything into complete chaos. Is it possible that, you know, what we accept, we accept the fact that Stanislaus did that, but is it possible that that was a work? Was it somehow this just incredible double bluff, you know, to even throw people off even more like that they, they were operating like in 3D chess or something like that. So thinking about, you know, we're all, was it, 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 was it even possible that that was somehow rigged? Stanislaus looking like he beat Wayne Munn to set up, you know, a, a, an even bigger rematch. And so, and this is where I was still kind of help working with people like Steve and stuff to think through it is you get to see that that we probably think that 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 was legitimate because there was no rematch, right? Like if they yeah. have been worse than you were, you were, like that's how you can tell. You can see through the booking what was real and what wasn't. Because, yeah, hey, in in hey. in the word in the words of Ernie Ladd, they gave Wayne Munn his comeback to the locker room. <laughs> that's exactly right. And you, that's right. And like so, you see it kind of with Dan O'Mahony too. When that the 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 most famous probably double cross and Dick Schickett takes the heavyweight title off Daniel Mahoney in Madison Square Garden. That had to be legitimate because Dick Schickett ends up going to work for another promoter and he takes the heavyweight title. He effectively like what Ric Flair did, right? When, you know, you show up on somebody else's promotion with the heavyweight championship. Like, that's a clear sign that was, that's pretty legitimate, you know? And then they end up in court and they're fighting it out. So, um, but it's incredible. And those double crosses, to me, that was, there's this incredible picture and I was lucky enough to get a copy of it to put in the book it, of um, Dick Schickett putting Dan Will Mahoney in this arm bar, right? And he's that's effectively the move that he uses to make poor Dano submit um, in, in front of Madison Square, Madison Square Garden. But you think of it from Dano's perspective. Here he is. He's not expecting this. And somehow this guy <laughs> is threatening to break his arm, pull his arm out of the socket in front of 8,000 people and humiliates him. And that just felt so real to me that that the the pain he must have been going through how horrible that must have felt to have that happen to him in front of all these people he lays in the ring for like five minutes because he can't move after he's been you know so beaten up by dick shicket and that that kind of stuff it just doesn't happen anymore and it's <laughs> thank god it doesn't happen anymore maybe but it was so interesting to me to, to, to again to put myself in these guys shoes and try to imagine what they were thinking and feeling well, see, the the thing is, you know, in those days, as we mentioned, most everybody had to have or better have some legitimate ability in the ring when the going gets tough. But the the double crosses were for major money, for major titles, right? To jockey leverage from one of the top wrestlers and promoters to the other, to or back to the trust or whatever it may be. And there was a lot on the line in those matches. And then by the by the 50s and 60s, if somebody got in a shoot or stretched somebody just because they were pissed at each other in the fucking ring, because there wasn't that, you know, they couldn't capitalize anymore. The promoters had taken uh, more tighter control of things by that point. But it looks like to me, when you go back and look at this era, and especially the, the 30s, that the promoters and the wrestlers in the 40s, 50s, and 60s either were around or still remembered the 30s and the 70s even to some extent, they were always chasing not only that level of popularity again, but they were also always staying away from the things that happened during that period of time that, that caused problems in the business, whether it be exposés or whether it be double crosses. And I'll, uh, you might not have heard this story. Brian knows it, but... I'll bore him constantly anyway. When Chris Candido 
in what was it 1994 won the nwa world title such as it was on a dennis corluzzo show he was flying back because he was in knoxville working for me regularly he's flying back and he meets in the airport bathroom he sees luthez right <laughs> luthez first match in <laughs> 1935 it's 1994 he was the personal <laughs> protege of Strangler Lewis. I can't wait and, to hear where this is going. <laughs> well, but Chris is the biggest wrestling fan in the world, and he's about to. Sh and they're at the urinal side by side, and he's lit he's about to shit himself at the urinal because he sees it Luthes, and he goes up after they dried their hands, and as humbly as he can, said, "Mr. Thes, oh yes, son." Mr. Thes, I and he can see the blonde hair. Thes can right. So and Chris was a. You know, even though he was short, he was a thick kid. Mr. Thez, I'm a wrestler. Chris Candido, it's such an honor to meet you. You know, and of course, Lou is very friendly. And then Chris says, he says, and you may find this hard to believe, but I just won <laughs> the NWA world title in a match at wherever it was in Cherry Hill or wherever. And Thez says, mm, he says, well, just remember, son. As you go around to these different territories, watch out. Somebody's going to want to try to double cross you. It was 1994 at this, but but yep. it was still ingrained in Thez. Watch out for the double cross. You got to be able to take care of yourself. 60 years I, late. No, and I completely agree with you. I mean, we were talking about the Pfeffer collection. I think what makes that so unique, um, if I could... I spent a little bit of time trying to figure out what made Jack Pfeffer tick, but I, 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 I he was so afraid, I think, of being double crossed. I think that's why he held on to all that stuff. Is I think he had felt so burned by promoters, he held on to all those documents so that should he ever need to create a paper trail of yeah. of of something, right? That he could he had something to hold over their heads. But what the promoters, the, all the other promoters, but the point there is that. They didn't hold on to any documents. They're, they they didn't want a paper trail. And I think the promoter, like you said, Roy Welch, all those guys who came out of that era, Roy, Roy Shire, all these guys that came out of that era, they knew the shorter the paper trail, the, the less that they could be pinned on them, right? And I think there's this incredible quote I found from um, – and this was in one of the – believe it or not, one of the letters in the Pfeffer collection. Al Half, who was the promoter in Cleveland wrote a letter to Jack Pfeffer in, I want to say 1937, when they were working together. And he says, effectively, don't put over anybody you can't control because they're going to make your life hell. And like that, that yeah. feels like that to me is like the, that's like the core kind of um, the like days, your day one for like what would become a professional wrestling from then on. It was guys you could control guys that would kind of work according to what the promoters wanted them to do. And that's what drove the business. And um, not to not to not to diminish any of those guys. I mean, because they were all amazing, but that it was that the promoters really controlled the business from then on. Well, and, and when you were at the Pfeffer Collection, I know it's it's mammoth. Did you see the I don't know if it's a card or an envelope or whatever the note about Christine Jarrett? Have you heard about this? Have you read about this? I feel like I've heard about it, but please t tell me again because I know that something happened between them. Well, I've always well there to is more about it. There is one note that I've seen a reproduction of that he jotted down on the back of an envelope or something or other, Pfeffer, saying, this is the night that Christine Jarrett threatened, T-R-E-A-T-E-N, to kill me. <laughs> in the, I mean, it, it was almost over for Jack, and it was the sometime in the 60s, and he was pulling the deal. Where if he was, I think he might have been managing the girls, or maybe I'm conflating this with the story in Texas, where the kind of same thing happened. But he'd go in with his girls and want the promoter to book him, or go in with whoever and want the promoter to book him, so he'd get his cut. And most of the time, just to not have trouble with Jack Pfeffer, they just do it. But uh, he came in, and Nick and Roy didn't want to play ball, and you know Pfeffer was so that was his standard thing. Well, I'll go to the newspaper. And Christine, I don't know, I'm sure she didn't use any profanity, but in some way she expressed upon him that if, if he tried to go expose their business, that they would kill him. <laughs> well, he, yeah, I mean, he gets, he, Pfeffer, I think someone actually is working on a book about him, but I mean, you can see, there's a couple of things. I think he gets, 
this may be an apocryphal story, but he gets dangled out of a window by one person. Not sure if that one's true. Maurice Talley punched him out for sure in a in a locker room. So, and he gets there's a story too that shows up. I want to say it's in maybe Life magazine. He got interviewed, but he gets punched out in a restaurant too by a wrestler. And I want to say 1938. So I think he was. <laughs> a lot of people wanted to kill him. I think pretty early I, on, a lot of people wanted to kill well, him. Well, <laughs> and I think that's where because Rip Rogers used to hear the story that. Bruiser took over Indiana by dangling somebody out a window, but I think that comes from the because I think Pfeffer really did get dangled out of a window, and I then it became really ap apocryphal for every promoter that a guy was mad at. You know, but I'll say too, and this is a conversation we were talking about. I, I think the beauty of that era, although this is a terrible story, but the beauty of that era, I think, is that it's again it's so hard to know what's real, and it, this is an extreme example of that. But this was a conversation we had actually had over email as I was working on the book. Was so um, to catch everybody up on the story. So again, Dick Schickett double crosses Dan Will Mahoney. Promoters effectively try to kind of buy him off to get the belt back. He won't do it. He goes to work for another promotion. So they sue him for breach of contract. It ends up in federal court in Columbus, Ohio, and the, in a court case that makes all kind of national headlines. During that period, Dick Schickett at one point gets a break from the trial. He goes to wrestle a match in Detroit where he drops the heavyweight title. His wife is actually killed in a car accident during that trip. She dies and she stays behind in Columbus and dies. There is like a theory floating around that the wrestling promoters somehow have gotten together and you know cut her brakes and she dies in this car accident <laughs> where they're capable of something like that. Which of course to me I think it's just it's more it's one of these things where kind of like the truth is stranger than fiction. It was just this terrible coincidence that happened that she happened to die during this trip. But that people still that's the kind of level of of what they were operating on. I think that people think they were even capable of doing something like that. That's how serious the business was back then. Of course, I think they had nothing to do with it. I think that's, I think it's impossible that they did that. But I think that's the kind of strange blending of fact and fiction into that era. It is so, so completely embodied that blending of fact and fiction. It's just endlessly interesting to me. You, you. That's the point that I've made for a long time, and some people still don't pick up on it. Is that you can suspect, or you can think, or you can think you know. Or as long as the other person or entity doesn't come out and tell you, yeah, you're fucking right, then there's always that mystery. And that's what creates the doubt and the suspension of disbelief. And that's where we went wrong. And these people went to extraordinary and sometimes superhuman lengths to, to not let everybody know what the fuck was going on, but, but encourage them to think anything they wanted as long as they showed up. And, I'll you know... I Oh, go ahead. Totally. No, no, I was just going to, I don't want to take us off topic here, but I mean, I was, it just, this just happened to me because we had a, one of the book, one of the events we did to kind of promote the book locally was um, we showed Andy Kaufman's I'm from Hollywood, which is a <laughs> documentary that uh, 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 Lynn Margulies, who was his girlfriend at the time, directed it, and made a documentary of Andy's career in wrestling. I'm sure most people probably know all about his career. But what struck me is, I mean, I've I loved Andy that his that whole era. I've, I've seen the movie a dozen times. But sitting in a movie theater where we were able to show it at a local theater here, we had a great crowd of people that came out. Watching it through the eyes of people that didn't know anything about Andy Kaufman's wrestling career. It brought all of that back to me of just like, you really can tell. Like this guy's getting in there, Jerry Lawler drops him on his head a couple times. You can't spot where the fiction is in there. And Andy Kaufman's in the hospital. He's in traction. He's wearing this neck brace on national TV for months at a time. And <laughs> Lynn is the woman that directed the movie said to me once, she's like, he would probably rather have died than ever admit that any of that was fake. And I mean, that's the level that they went to. And, you know, and he grew up as a kid watching Buddy Rogers on television, you know, pointing to his head, I'm the smartest one. But my, I've told this story, but my cousin Larry's wife was a nurse at the time in Memphis at the hospital that they took Andy to. And she, and I was, because I was the, you know, the young photographer in those days, I wasn't even a manager yet. So when I was down there, I'd stay at their house for free. And, you know, I come back from the matches and she comes home from the night shift and said, hey, they brought Andy Kaufman in. He's really hurt. 
It made it, I'm I'm there, but it made her kind of think there's something to the wrestling. It's dangerous. When I got involved in it, they're like, oh shit, because they didn't know. And and you mentioned that the old timers knew how to pass a medical examination for various things. That's what you you know, neck injury. I don't know about now with modern technology and these right. you know scanning machines, right. but in those even in the eighties. You got this symptom in your neck, and you heard that, you felt that. We can't tell. That's what it, it built the personal injury lawsuit uh, fucking industry. Um, <laughs> no, it, before the days of X-rays, right? it was a lot easier. Right, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, right. And I mean, you know, uh, uh, Gus Sonnenberg the, spends a night in the hospital after a match with Ed Lewis. You know, he gets ridden in a, driven in an ambulance, you know, and he spends a weekend in the hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. I mean, it's un, and that's all over the newspaper the, people the, were writing the little about tricks that. the little tricks spread to ronnie west the the referee uh for georgia wrestling for so many years was a great guy huge fan helped promote shows blah 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 but if they did a deal in the chattanooga memorial auditorium on a saturday night where one of the heels cracked him over the head with a boot or something and he got juice he would make sure it was a nice one and get stitches on purpose eight or ten and then over the next few days, he would go around downtown Chattanooga and going into restaurants or bars or businesses with this big gash. Well, what happened to you? Oh, that damn interns last Saturday night. That's grassroots promotion. The referees actually go in and say, please come see Saturday night to see if I can get even with them because I'm going to be in the corner of so-and-so or whatever, right? Or just to make the business look real. Yeah, they, they bashed my head open. Oh, shit. I, you know, I've, 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 again, I think what got me so interested in doing this is, and you mentioned this earlier too, is that there's no line. When you're a professional wrestler in that era, there was no line. Like when you left the, re the arena, if you're in the bar, if you're in the supermarket, if you're wherever, you're that guy. You have to be that guy. Because as soon as you get up to people and say, oh, no, that's all bullshit, that, that's just an act. I mean, that's the end of it back then. So they had to live. And I, and I, you get, again, I'm sure you, you can tell me way more than this, but I've heard stories where it's like, Wrestlers basically, in some respects, swerved their families, where it was just like they didn't really even talk about whether it was fake when they went home. Oh, and no, so the, like yes. A, and yeah. I hate to use the word fake. I've said that a couple of times. I don't mean to, to use that word. It's a word. Just throw it's that word work. around. But it's, no, you, but, you know, you sometimes you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't smarten up your wife in the old days. And I mean, I, when I got into business, there was still some people who would, you know, follow that. This is only 40 years ago. You didn't smarten the kids up sometimes at all or sometimes until they were a certain age where you could count on them not to go brag and they knew more than the other kids at school, right? And it, and if they were properly indignant when when uh, somebody called their dad fake, then that was even better and you know kids aren't good actors. So, but Jesse Barr, uh Sandy Barr's son, Art Barr's brother, when I managed him when I first got started in Memphis, he invited me over to his apartment for uh, you know, lunch after we came back to Nashville from Memphis TV, and he said, now, nah, I haven't smartened my wife up yet, so, uh, okay. Well, he had, he was ribbing me, and he had smarted her up, but I I was working with him because, okay, it wasn't that fucking odd, right? And, you know, you, you had to be, you had to be careful. Well, now anybody with a goddamn internet, they, they're not going to get married to anybody before they're smart to the wrestling business. But that, that was, again, you had to blur the lines. There were instances where Terry Funks told the story uh, when he was a kid. Guy in Amarillo came up to Dory Sr. in a restaurant. Uh, a bunch of bullshit. And Dory Sr. just beat the ever-loving shit out of that guy right in that restaurant. Had to protect the business. Dory Funk Sr. is the toughest guy in Texas. But then guys would do angles where they would agree to go to a public place and create some kind of disturbance and get arrested on purpose. But in the event, you've read the Bruiser and Alex Karras thing in Detroit, probably Bruiser decided on his own and didn't and got out of hand. And, and, and Karras was probably not apprised of what exactly was going to go on. And that made the fucking papers, but it it's a blur of all of the realities, some partially none. C com complete. I'll say two quick things. It's like, I, you see that um, in 19, 1929, you know, Gus Sonnenberg, he was my, Gus Sonnenberg is my, probably my all-time favorite. I mean, I, he was a 
again, I, I don't know if we mentioned this, but he was a football player turned professional wrestler in the end of the 1920s, but he's the biggest name in wrestling for a period of time. And he's walking around Los Angeles downtown, gets approached by a guy who wants to kind of challenge him to a match. And in broad daylight in the middle of the afternoon, in the middle of the middle of Los Angeles, right? Middle of Hollywood, this guy headbutts him on the street in his, in, you know, Gus falls to the ground, knocked unconscious. Police have to come. The guy gets arrested, right? And that makes national headlines. All the other promoters who are trying to kind of uh, take him down. It's just like, how does this heavyweight champion get, you know, taken out by a regular guy on the street? I mean, he was humiliated by that. And well, so you they, see they, that. They, they, they put the belt on a worker and who got caught by surprise. And then that was the instigation for uh, Lewis and company deciding, well, we need to take control of this thing. And that was the next double cross pretty soon. Correct. It, it, uh, exactly. So there from the, the title goes from there to, they put it on, um, Oh, Ed, uh, oh God, now I'm going to blank on his name, but a, a legitimate Ed, wrestler. Ed, Ed, Ed Don George. Ed Don George. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Ed Don George. And so it goes to a legitimate worker at that point. But all of that stuff served to kind of hurt Gus Sonnenberg's reputation where he went. He was just the biggest wrestler in the world for a period of time. And you see his popularity kind of trail off because of different, a couple of different controversies. But, I mean, that era, and this is, again, why. And I now Lewis, Lewis never, Lewis had a chapped ass about that because when he, <laughs> for business reasons, put, you know, put the belt on Sonnenberg, he was supposed to be the one to get it back. And then they put it on Ed Don George, who had wrestled in the Olympics. But that didn't get, make a shit to Lewis, and it took him a little while to get back in the picture. And then you see now, and this is a whole rabbit hole. I mean, somebody—if somebody hasn't read a book on this, somebody probably could. The I, there's a match in Montreal that happens around that time where you know the uh, the Lewis, they say Lewis bit the guy, the heavyweight champion, and the Lewis gets disqualified with Henri de Glane for a matchup in Montreal. And there's all this controversy around this match and was it work and was it, I mean, there are so many examples in that era where the line, like we just keep saying is so completely blurred between reality and fiction. It's un, it's, it's just incredible. But that era to me, and this is why I wanted to write the book so bad is it, it, again, I think to me, it's such a, I don't know if it's fair to say it's uniquely American, but I think it, it's a, it's a fairly uniquely American invention uh, professional wrestling, and I just feel like that 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 hadn't that hadn't been the book that book hadn't been, been written yet. It's like, where did this thing come from? Like, what what? How did this all get started? How did it get off the ground? And I think that's the this is the era where it all happened. And it again, I think all of the conventions that we made us all love wrestling, no matter really what era you came to it in, I think they were all created back then. And all these guys just were creating it, like you said in real time from whole cloth, basically day, just figuring out what works from day to day. Uh, some by happenstance, some through just kind of the, the sweat of their imagination is, as they used to say, like um, figuring out what's going to sell tickets and what's going to keep people interested in this thing. And it's just incredible. Um, again, like the stuff they set in motion to see how it's just grown and evolved here in, in you know, some ways more popular than ever. It's incredible. And, you know, I just realized I've dominated this thing. Brian, are you still with us? I'm still with you. I'm listening. This is great. Uh, do you have, because I know you love the book as much as I do, which is, again, an hour after we said it originally, Ballyhoo, the <laughs> Roughhousers, Con Artists, and Wild Men Who Invented Professional Wrestling by John Langmead, who you've been hearing speak. Uh, Brian, what do you got? You got to ask John something. Well, you know, I just think it's an incredible uh, feat to put all these stories together. I own the master copy of the Ed Strangler Lewis manuscript that you referenced before. And, yes. you know, I have that. I have the Fall Guys. I have the annotated Fall Guys. I have Steve Yohe's Strangler Lewis book. There are all these different books, whether you're talking about Fall Guys, which, you know, the veracity of it at times has been questioned, which is why you have the annotated version. And we think a lot of it came from Tootsmont. The Strangler Lewis story is his story in his own words. You had to find a way to kind of take all of these elements and then incorporate the people that didn't say anything and didn't write down anything. And then these newspaper reports, which are all over the place. How tough was it for you to feel comfortable each chapter that you got what was right, right, and what was wrong, wrong? That's a good question. I, I think... I will, I will again give credit to, you know, all of the big historians, Steve and 
Steve Yoey and Johnson and Greg and, and, and a lot, I would, they've let me bounce so much information off them. And I just, and, and Tim and everybody, they were without fail. These guys are the nicest guys and they were so willing to share information and eager to talk. And it's just, it, it, they're just an incredible resource and I wish they got more, uh, more attention um, so that they were a humongous help. I mean, I could bounce questions off them where I felt um, unsure about something or I could kind of they would help me sort of check, check myself if I, if, if I wasn't, you know, really competent in anything. I think anytime you're playing around in this era, you're uh, running a lot of risks. I will say that the one thing I was really, really kind of I didn't want to do was perpetuate any myths. So I'll give it like a quick example of that is something like. um the term the gold dust trio gets thrown around a lot. And I remember it drives poor Steve Yoey crazy because he's like, no, you know, that was a term that was invented during fall guys. They didn't really call them that. Like you don't see newspapers where they mention the gold dust trio, for example, before that's a term used in fall guys. And now we just use it. But it was probably Tutman who coined that term for himself. You know, like he was probably rewriting wrestling history in some ways with that term. But so I didn't want to use that or even the word like kayfabe, which I didn't want to use it um, because that wasn't how the wrestlers spoke about themselves in that era. And so I was really trying to be sensitive to that. Um, Like you said, I tried to just if I felt like something just I couldn't totally validate it. I tried to leave it out because I just didn't want to take that chance of moving and I'm sure I made some mistakes. I'm sure people will correct the record on me, and, I, and I'm totally open to that. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, too, is because Jim mentioned this briefly in the beginning, is I, I struggled with a lot with what to include and what not to include. So that's why the note section is so long, and I hope people do read the notes, is because stuff I felt would disrupt the story potentially or that wasn't completely like – right on point with the main narrative, I moved to the notes section. And there's, I hope, a lot of really useful um, information in that section, too. It didn't, didn't quite fit the story. I was worried I would lose people along the way, but I didn't want that stuff to get lost either. Jack Hurley's kind of the mantra of the book. You always return to him no matter what else is happening in different parts of the country with all these different characters. You began the book, without playing spoiler, with an interesting chapter that illustrates Jack Curley's influence and power in New York and on Long Island. It's the U.E. Kingfish Long chapter that you began the book with. It was an interesting decision to start the book with that. What caused you to do it? Well, I kind of, when I came across that story in the first place, I, I felt like, and for people who, so to give people some quick background who haven't read the book. So Huey Long, who was the um, senator from New York, um, pretty powerful figure, um, pretty controversial figure, was at a, uh, uh, kind of society dinner in Great Neck, Long Island, which was, you know, this incredibly moneyed part of, of New York, full of, you know, um, uh, entertainers and Broadway performers and, and great, uh, the great Gatsby is set there. Fitzgerald lived there for a long time. Anyway, he's at this high society party, which kind of inherently conflicts with his sort of image of this great populist and very, you know, the great working man's representative. So anyway, he's at this party and has too much to drink and, and gets into a, an altercation in, in the bathroom. And Jack Curley, the wrestling promoter, in fact, helps him kind of smuggles him out of the party. And they try to keep his name out of the papers and they try to kind of let this thing go without too much too much press, which of course doesn't happen and it ends up in a million newspapers. But my, when I first came across this, story, I thought there's no way this could be the same Jack Curley. And of course it turned out to be, I mean, it's just another example of him just showing up all these incredible times in history. But so I felt like for me, I, this was a, without getting too kind of far down in the woods here, like there's a certain element, I think of cynicism that can set in sometimes with people where it's just like, well, you know, wrestling's a fake, everything's a fake, sports are fake, everything's rigged, this is rigged, that's rigged. And I really fight hard against that kind of belief. Like, I just, I don't believe it. I don't buy it. And I'm not trying to talk politics or whatever. But I felt like that story was sort of this really cool, un, again, the truth being stranger than fiction. You couldn't write that, right? Like, what are the odds here? This Huey Long guy, you know, ends up in New York, gets attacked in the bathroom, tries to cover it up tells a million different stories about what happened, none of which anybody buys. They end up seeing the truth. And the the truth, which I won't spoil for people, is so pathetic and pitiful about what really happened to him in the bathroom. It's just like that's this perfect example where it's like, you know, you can fool people some of the times, you can't fool all the people all the time kind of thing. And it's just like, 
it, it just it, somehow that blend of wrestling and politics was kind of too irresistible for me to to leave out. John, this book is something that Jim and I have had many conversations off air about. Even before we started talking on air about it, we loved it. And I had the same reaction that Jim had. I was upset when it ended. I was upset when there was no more. Even though the notes are great, I wanted more of the book. It was great. What are you working on next? What are you thinking about working on next? And do you plan to dive more into wrestling's history, specifically pre-World War II in the future? Well, right now I'm working on music. Um... It's, I've got a, I play in a couple different bands um, that are keeping me kind of busy right this second. So um, I will quickly put plugs in for those real quick, but I play with a band called The Paranoid Style. If anybody's heard of them, uh, we just had a, have a, a record that just came out on Bar None, and I play in a band called Choo Choo La Rouge that people can check out. We have a record coming out on uh, Kayam Records. As far as the, that's keeping me pretty busy right this second, but as far as the wrestling goes, you know, I had kind of sworn off I wasn't going to really write any more about wrestling. I sort of just wanted to focus on some other things, but I'm starting to get ideas of I'd love to do something on the 1980s. I, 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 it's the era that I grew up watching. It's the era I kind of grew up loving and the characters that I grew up loving. Um, and there's just something there, I feel like. And I, I've been thinking a lot of whether it could make a make a make a book. But um, that's what I'm starting to think too much of, starting to think more about. Um, cause again, that era, that's when I think, again, the truth and fiction got blended just so incredibly. And again, an era where the promoters were basically fighting to the death, you know, in that era. And I kind of like, again, what you saw in the 1930s, where they were basically fighting each other to, to the, to the, like a bloody end, basically. Back to you, Jim. No, hey, no, I, I just say, you know, we've done everything but tell the people how they can get this book. Ballyhoo, the roughhousers, con artists, and wild men who invented professional wrestling by John Langmead. John, do they just, do they go to Amazon? Are we in Barnes and Noble? They got to go to the corner gas station. What's going on? How can we get this book? <laughs> and by the way, we will have an Amazon link uh, on Twitter for the listeners. Let me just throw that in here. Thanks. No, so hopefully all of those things, hopefully the corner gas station is carrying it. Hopefully Barnes and Noble is carrying it, but anywhere you get books, you can get it. Uh, uh, Amazon definitely is carrying it. Uh, put a plug in for uh, bookshop.org and some of the independent retailers too, that you can definitely get it from. Um, but anywhere you get, anywhere you get books, you should be able to get a copy of it. It's out on university of Missouri, greatest publication, greatest press in the world. And, uh, yeah, please check it out. And I just can't thank everybody enough that's that's bought a copy and read about it or written about it. And it just it means the world to me that people have have so far it seemed to be enjoying it and getting some getting something out of it. So I just I can't say thanks to everybody enough. John, thank you for being part of the program. And we hope that everybody gets a copy of this, especially all the people in the wrestling business today. You can learn how it's supposed to be done. Directly from the experts, through John, of course. Anyway, we're going back to our regularly scheduled bullshit. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, our talk with John Langmead, who wrote the book Ballyhoo that Brian mangled the title of, but we got it right in the interview, and we encourage everybody, not only just some fascinating people that this book profiles, but also it literally shows you step by step how sometimes by design and sometimes completely inadvertently these people profiled and the the actions that they took invented professional wrestling that in some cases we still know it today in some shrouded in 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 the sands of time uh reasonings still exist from the pioneer days and it's it's a great book and if, you're, and if you're in the Madison Square Garden history, this is a brilliant look back at everything pre raka pre them bringing fans back, everything that led to big yeah. crowds and then killing off the crowds. But for all of wrestling history, you know, pre World War II, this book is astounding. It's astounding. It's uh, and it, it should be standing out in the parking lot. No, it's outstanding. It should be outstanding in the parking lot. Um, but anyway, that's the kind of audience, Brian, the people that want to know the whys and wherefores of the pioneer days. How, how did all this get started? What's causing all this? That's the same kind of audience, the discriminating, discerning audience that listens 
to the wrestling news and the fine programs over at the Arcadian Vanguard Network. What's going on this week? That is exactly right. Get information about all the shows on Twitter at Super Podcasts or on Facebook at facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. A few notes this week on Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon. Mike Sempervivi is his guest for a special look back at Ole Anderson. Some people did tribute shows and painted Ole in a really bad light. Here's a very fair and balanced look at Ole Anderson from Mike Sempervivi, an expert in Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling. Hear that today with Brian Solomon, suawpod.com. I work for Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon. Wherever you find your favorite podcast, are you snickering? I'm, I'm, nevertheless, you mind what I might be doing over here. Well, you can find out what Jim's doing over there and what's happening over here and everywhere else on the Wrestling News. Every day, get your wrestling news for free. No clickbait, no paywall, just the wrestling news. No opinion, just the wrestling news. I just said it. Get it directly from thewrestlingnews.com or wherever you find your favorite podcast. Look for Arcadian Vanguards, the wrestling news, and of course, the 605 Super Podcast. Go through the archive today at 605pod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcasts, The Mothership. Well, you know, that was a musical interlude there, and and that's what we got on, on SmackDown the other night. Uh, what was the, the date of SmackDown? March 15th, a Friday night, red letter day, because we got not only the professional wrestling program, but we got a big singing concert from The Rock, the biggest star in pro wrestling today. I'm trying to find my notes on this show. Here they are. And as 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 I predicted, Brian, I believe a couple weeks ago, as The Rock had asked for, Memphis, Tennessee was sold out for the return of The Rock. And that was the FedEx Forum. Is that 13, 14,000 people, I would assume? I would assume. Somewhere around there? Somewhere around there. Well, I'm glad you were able to be so specific. So still Sputnik Monroe, counting the people that knocked the outfield fence down, still has the record. He's got more people, but The Rock is in number two place now behind, or in ahead of Jerry Lawler. So, I mean, right now, they had 25 minutes of The Rock and then an hour and a half of everything else. It's... It's night and day, and they can let him go out there and just do whatever the fuck he wants to do. He's stealing the show. And they they opened the show with the, the tape package of last week's confrontation with Cody and Seth and Roman and blah, 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 that did apparently almost 3 million viewers last week, I believe, again, for their segment on SmackDown. And then... The Rock comes out and the place goes batshit, not only because it's The Rock, but now he's been promoing and everybody knows at this point, that audience, Memphis, my old hometown, I started here. And so now he switched it up because he was, and we're going to talk in a second about how you were exactly right. People hated him when he was trying to be a baby face, but now that he's the greatest heel in the world, people love him. How do you win here? But he got the Rocky chance. He got a huge response, but he changed it up where he didn't torture scorch Memphis, as he said, because Memphis is different. Every, he said so many good things about Memphis in previous interviews in, in the young rock or whatever, that he couldn't come out and knock him, or it wouldn't be. So he did the bizarro world thing. Now Brett's back in Canada, but he's still knocking. Cody and and Seth and these people ate it up. And it was you know from plug in channel 5 got a big pop telling individual people in the audience that he loved them and that finally the rock has come back home. He's done that before. He did that I think at the garden. Well, He's, you know, he's a rich man. He's got more than one house. Yeah, Rocky Johnson traveled a lot around a lot. So now he can go to every single town they run SmackDown in and say he's home. Well, he, he once lived in fucking Halifax, Nova Scotia. But anyway, it was, this was a kind of a stand-up routine that turned into a concert. 
Would you want The Rock to sing a song? If he'd have said, would you like to watch The Rock take a shit? Yes, God, yes. And if you'd like to hear it, here it goes. He's got a Grammy-nominated guy on the guitar and a Memphis guy on the harmonica. Harmonica? Harmonica. But they it worked. These guys, they just do the fucking harmonica guitar strum thing, and it, it fucking worked. And he sang a blues song about Cody and Seth. And suddenly he's he's BB King with the patter in between the verses. I'm just well, you got us. You're being now. This is getting ridiculous. He's BB King. He was BB King. BB King with the patter in between the verses. The he's king of the, the blues. He's the king of the blues now. He's oh yes, yes he is. And he's right down there on Beale Street. Okay, you go out there with and give that delivery and figure out how to sing that song with these two yahoos standing on the announce desk with a guitar and a harmonica. And and you know, and saying about the I can't even I can't do he the had music. He put his reading justice. glasses on. He has reading glasses on so he can read the script that Gewurz wrote for him for the song. Well, but he he got all of it in before the harmonic he stopped playing. I'm gonna I'm gonna say something and I'll let you continue with the review so I don't interrupt you anymore. This concert thing, the singing thing, was so stupid and lame. And this is everything that is lame about the rock. The promo he did after it was exactly the right thing for the rock. But this yes. is bad. And here's the other problem. People are going to say right now, hey, what about the Raw review? Where's the Raw review? You didn't watch Raw. You didn't see the Cody Rhodes promo. Well, that's I forgot. A really strong promo from Cody, but a very different tone. Cody cried. Cody was crying because of trying to win this for his mom and because of the pressure and he needs to complete his story. So you have him crying and you have The Rock turning into Andrew Dice Clay and doing insult humor. And then doing babyface things, he was a babyface here. So you don't help. This is what I was afraid of, like you said before. You don't help your top babyface when your top heel is doing things to get cheered. And yet, and when nobody can touch this stuff, and I'm and I'm sorry you didn't like the concert. It was you lame, know, lame and slow. I thought you lame had musical taste. The next thing you're going to tell me, you don't like my singing. I can't, well, you wouldn't be that crazy. I know my singing. Your singing's, your singing's terrible. Yes, it, it, it's, it's, the, it's the real pips. It's the Adam's apple. A real pips. But, yeah, all of them. All four of them. Three of them. I thought there was four. Well, I, unless you're counting Gladys Knight as one of the pips. Is Gladys well, Knight what, a pip? There, was there a lost pip? Did they have to downsize? Pip Sabian. Pip Sabian, the lost Pip. Anyway, back to The Rock. I love the concert because what a fucking performance. And yes, that's the thing. He's still being an asshole and he's knocking the baby faces, but because he's so incredible at it, they're cheering the fuck out of him. And it was Memphis. And he made a big deal out of it being Memphis. He could have run for fucking mayor and won here. But he and, shouldn't have. That's the point. But uh, 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 well, exactly. That's part of the point. Remember, I said when he came out to be a babyface, people fucking hated him, didn't want him in the match, and started booing him. So now he's become a heel. But since he's the greatest heel in the goddamn world by such a wide margin, the people are going to cheer every fucking smart ass thing he says. But they worked with him somewhat when he got serious at the end and started crossing the line with his inappropriate comments about Cody's mother and et cetera, to where that I believe they started working about, about ooh, he shouldn't say that. But that's what, when he cut the promo on Cody, slapping him last week, and then mentioned, well, Cody showed up on Raw, and what's he going to say? And that's where I realized, shit, I forgot to watch. And they showed a clip of him crying when he would, when he was saying that, his father wasn't here anymore for him to hand that belt to when he wins it, but he can hand that belt to his mother. And say so it looked like a pretty impactful promo. And now but The then, Rock's cutting promos on Twitter and on the show on Cody's mother. So again, the heel's doing things that the babyface is getting no, nothing for. The babyface is just taking it, but the heel's getting more cheers. The heel's doing more babyface things. This is the problem. You're throwing off the whole dynamic. You're going to spoil the match before it happens. 
do you think Michelle's going to be in the front row and get to slap the rock? Really, Cody should go out there and go, you want to talk about my family? Your grandmother was the least successful promoter ever, and you're putting her in the Hall of Fame. At least I'm honest about my family. I don't pretend like every one of my family belongs in a Hall of Fame. And then he inducts his mom into the Hall of Fame. Well, there you go. You're just, you're a rock hater. I am a rock truther. Well, I hate to use the word truther. I tell the truth about the rock. When he's good, I say it. When he's lame, I say it. I don't pretend like he wants everyone to pretend like his shit doesn't stink. It does. You just got to call it out. The concert was lame as fuck and unnecessary and changes the dynamic too much in the feud. The promo at the end was strong. That was great. But this is coming off Cody crying on Raw. And then The Rock's coming out here like a stand-up doing a routine. It's ridiculous. Throws off the whole balance. The Rock leaning into the heel stuff is the right thing. But be a heel. Be a heel that fans want to throw garbage at. Not a heel that the fans want to laugh with. An unbalanced Rock is what you're saying. Uh, I, I guess. Yes. I guess. Well... Well, all I can say is what The Rock said when he hands Mama Rhodes the weight belt that he's going to beat her son bloody with, and he's going to sing to her, Michelle, what can I say except you're welcome? That was a killer line. That was a brilliant killer line. That's, I don't know if you would know it. That's a song he sang in a Disney movie. Well, I, I, I knew that. That's why it got such a big reaction. It wasn't just from his singing. It was the specific uh, I, I song thought, he was I, singing i thought it, it was because the note he hit actually i didn't have any idea what he was doing there but but if you smell what the final boss is cooking i'm at 25 minutes just give him the whole show because fuck it then i don't even need to see the pay-per-view i just want to watch the show every week if he's on it all the time the problem is when you start the show with a long thing like this it makes it hard to get through the rest of it when you know there's going to be nothing else even of this caliber you almost have to end the show with a segment like this because at least then you sit through everything. I kind of was in and out the rest of the show. Oh, well, in that case, Brian, I can tell you in very brief terms what you missed. You missed the heel luchadors fighting the babyface luchadors. That was on last week's show, I believe. And the well, week before they did, that. They, they did it again. Oh. And then you missed an L.A. Knight promo. Oh, I saw this. I saw this. Okay, in the entrance way. They've, they've smartened up. They just need to let L.A. Knight go out and talk to you. And he cut the promo on A.J. Styles and called him out, and A.J. wasn't there. He called him Napoleon Styles. And so he did his promo, and the people are with him, and he challenged A.J. for the a match at WrestleMania. You can show up there, maybe. And then AJ comes from behind with a chair and whacks him and sits on him and accepts. So, yes, they can service the people quite well by just letting LA Knight come out and talk, but I don't think he needs to end up on his back more often than not at the end of talking. Do you? I was just about to ask you, haven't they cooled him off too much in the last few months since The Rock came in? I think, well... It, not, I not that think... it's his fault, but it just it threw off the dynamic of who was in the main right. event and who wasn't. Well, not only cooled him off, but maybe just everybody else is interacting with, he's interacting with AJ Styles. Before he was interacting with Roman Reigns or with the top, now he's interacting with AJ and there's a bunch more people ahead on the pecking order. Orton's back, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then they do the deal where Logan Paul is telling Nick Aldis that he expected Aldis to fine or discipline Orton for last week. At least Orton owes an apology. And Aldis tells, well, Logan, why don't you go ask Randy Orton for an apology in person? And uh, Logan Paul, well, I guess I will since you can't do your job well or whatever the fuck he's saying. But then we get Grayson Waller versus Randy Orton. So. Austin Theory's in the corner, and Logan Paul comes out for color, but now it's 9 o'clock by the time this thing started. That's all we've seen on the show is basically The Rock and eh. 
And then we got to see Waller, which is like watching George Goulas. There's no physique. Oh, come on. It's come on. There's an awkwardness there of just existing, unnatural body movements. George Goulas, that's a, that's a big insult, considering what everyone always says about George Goulas. Uh, well, he's somebody, not that bad. You know, he's not that bad. Somebody always, ha- even if you're the absolute worst wrestler of all time, sooner or later, somebody's going to come along. It's even worse. He did nothing as ridiculous as Austin Theory's bump here. Oh, well, that's where I was going. Because finally, Orton, the finish, he gives Waller the DDT. Theory pops up and pulls Waller out to the floor, so Orton gives Theory the DDT, and then RKO's Waller, and one, two, three, pins him. But then Theory gets Orton from behind, and he's holding him for Logan Paul. And Logan Paul's going to give him the big punch with the titanium fist or whatever the fuck. And here comes Owens. And to make the save, Owens gives Theory a stunner and once Theory, once he landed, Owens landed on his ass, Theory waits like two seconds and takes a big giant leap behind and backward, back and to the right. This may be analyzed by the Warren Commission. A big giant leap back and to the right. What a else? Big giant One leap from the 60s. Back and to the right on a, like I said, a two second delay, and Orton grabbed him with the RKO. And it just, it was, oh, it was so bad. And yeah. I can, t- exactly what it is, is now Theory has reached the point where he realizes they were using me. I had all these opportunities. I had the belt. Now I'm the flunky of this annoying fucking Australian. And I'm beaten all the time. And he's trying too hard to get noticed. He knows that his... The last thing that he can do that they he can't control whether he wins a match. He can't control whether he gets a big interview and gets to tell people off and somebody else doesn't shit on his face. He can't control the time he gets on screen, but he takes great athletic bumps and all that shit. So now he's trying too hard to do that and it was just it no it did not fucking work at all it was one of the more cartoony things you'll see on that fucking show which imagine how much territory that takes in and so then nick aldis came out and the u.s title match with logan paul defending is going to be versus kevin owens and randy orton in a three-way triple threat match at WrestleMania. And I said, Boo! Oh, Boo! Yeah. Hold on here one second. I was actually looking yeah. forward to Orton versus Logan Paul more than any Orton match in recent memory. Yeah. And that got shot down. So we lost good... The, the card that they did have is looking better than the card we're getting. We lost Gunther and Brock. And now it's Cody and Rollins. Cody and Rollins. I mean, uh, CM Punk and Rollins, excuse me. Punk and Rollins. Yeah, there you go. I was going to say Cody and Rollins. We haven't lost that one. That one got uh, metamorphosized. Uh, But anyway, so then on the program, Dragon Lee fought Pablo Escobar. Escobar won. The heels got more heat. Carlito made the save. They stopped Carlito. Rey Mysterio came out. Escobar bailed out, and Mysterio asked for a match next week. So we'll keep an eye on that fluid situation. And then apparently they were running long because of the of the concert in the first segment, because purely dreary and Butch and Bait opened at the bell with no entrances or introductions or anything. Just ding, here we go. And it was like... It's WWE's version of AEW. It's wrestling with children for children. Between the, the the two with the long hair and the fishnet outfits and the other two guys that, you know, are vertically challenged, at, at the, to say the least, it's just, do you take these people seriously at, at the appearance of them? I don't. I skipped the match, too. Very good. And finally, the main event was Bailey versus Dakota Kai. 
And of course, uh, Sky and Sane and Oscar were in the corner of Kai. And they, they rang the bell with 10 minutes left in the show, went a minute and went to the break. So I thought maybe something's going to happen. A sinkhole will open up under the ring at the end, so I'll see the finish. And basically what happened was Bailey tossed Dakota Kai out to the floor, and then all three of the heels jumped into the ring. And Bailey starts fighting them, and she nails a couple, but then she faces off with Sky, and the referee is standing there watching this whole thing. And then when they get in a fight, Sky and Bailey, then the referee suddenly rings the bell like he's seen a ghost and calls for the disqualification. And I was trying to figure out, did they tell him? Like, as soon as, you know, Bailey and Sky start fighting and he didn't know the other two were going to jump in first, I don't know what the fuck. But then, after he rings the bell and calls for the disqualification, there are three women, five feet of height or under, attacking Bailey, and the male referee just jumps out to the floor and doesn't even try to restrain any of the heels from doing this. And then here comes Naomi. And Naomi hits the ring, but the heels beat her up. And then one of the girls, the heels, I'm not sure whether it was Sky or Carrie, or, but she climbed up to the top while the other girls were holding Bailey and did a moonsault and Brian did you see the moonsault or had you zoned out by this point I was zoned out by this point okay two of the girls one's got a, each leg right and one of the girls has Bailey's arms so they've stretched her out where she's a, like a hammock like a hammock in between them above the, the mat right and the other girl goes to the top to do the moonsault and Obviously, it's like the Vegematic principle. When you moonsault and she's going to hit her in the midsection, it's going to go boom, boom, and look like even worse impact. So you got this picture, right? Right. Guess where she moonsaulted her and landed? On her face? On her fucking face. Oh. Landed right across her fucking face. And the girl holding her hands even had to lean back some like, shit, you almost got me. And that was the end of the show. All right, that was SmackDown. He's ripping up these notes now, ladies and gentlemen. That's how disgusted he was with everything after his uh, his uh, number one boy toy, The Rock, had his. Well, I, I love the, the, the Rock came out there. The Rock was like Bobby Blue Bland. Oh come on! The <laughs> Give Rock me a was break. like the Rock was like Brian Melagelli. All right, well, blind Jimmy Johnson over here, or whatever we want to call him. The Rock you. was like Bleeding Gums Murphy. Bleeding Gums Murphy. All right, well, I'm going to be like Howlin' Wolf, and I'm going to get out of here in a moment. Hey, well, you can't close this show up. It's my show. If anybody's going to close this son of a bitch up, it'll be me. All right. Would you like me to close this son of a bitch up? I would love you to close this son close. of a bitch up. We're getting close to WrestleMania, and don't worry, we're going to be all over it like a cheap suit. But until then, we'll be back with the drive through in a few days and the experience next week. Stay tuned to the YouTube channel for all the various goodness that happens in between. And otherwise, thank you, fuck you, and bye-bye, everybody.